Devin, yeah. uh, and you and I have just chatted briefly. Um, what I was hoping that we would get out of here, and you're telling, you told me we will touch on this for sure, is how the legislators themselves are kind of are vulnerabilities, risks uh, in this system. But you have a presentation yeah. that you've prepared. So, so um, for the record, uh, new as of yesterday. So uh, <laughs> uh, apologies for the non-updated signature block. Uh, Kevin Moore, uh, deputy director. Excuse me, director of IT for the General Assembly. Director of. Director of. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, for the General Assembly. Uh, so. Um, Good morning, thank you for having me. Um, I did try to do some interpretation based off the subject line, uh, so if I'm not going in the right direction, please uh, redirect me. Uh, I'm happy to discuss anything you would like to discuss. So given that, turn the page, sir, thank you. Um, so I've structured, uh, it's just a handful of slides. Uh, <clears throat> what are we talking about? Uh, current training opportunities that are available to uh, legislators and staff alike, but specifically legislators. Um, common concerns and vulnerabilities we have with staff and legislators specifically. Um, it does focus primarily on cybersecurity, um, as that has been a sole focus, or not the sole, but a primary focus of this committee, uh, is cybersecurity, so I may, wanted to make sure we were there. And then training recommendations uh, in order to address those concerns and vulnerabilities. So, um, some of the current training opportunities we provide, in-house training. Uh, so it's developed in-house, it's either ad hoc in nature, or we actually put together uh, some presentation materials, class, class materials. Um, it's available to legislators in a variety of ways. Uh, it could be a specific one-on-one -on -one scenario. It could uh, be a committee as a whole that we train. That's a very frequent request we receive at the beginning of session to provide re refresher uh, training uh, opportunities. It is typically uh, centered around the use of the iPad within the uh, committee process. Um, but we talk about many different technologies that are in use uh, during those conversations and how to use them better and uh, um, how to use them to improve the productivity of that committee. Um, <clears throat> the uh, other times that we provide training uh, is when uh, technology changes have been significant, uh, what IT seems as significant, and uh, then we directly reach out to those committees and uh, request uh, time to uh, talk about it and uh, update everybody, to make sure everybody's comfortable with those changes. Um, and then the other piece that uh, we take care of in-house is uh, new as of last year, which we uh, want to see continue. We are very happy to see it happen, which was the House Cybersecurity Training uh, for the entire chamber. Um, it was more of me talking at folks, which is not great, uh, but it is the only opportunity that we've had so far to address the uh, body as a whole uh, and provide the same information as a whole. Um, it was incredibly beneficial from our perspective to have that happen, and we would really appreciate at some point uh, doing the same for the uh, Senate chamber. Um, hopefully we can do that in the future. Questions before we move on? Do you have to have people using electronics in the Senate? Well, it's not, it's not specific to the chamber, Senator. Um, it, it, it certainly can, um, the presentation doesn't have to happen within the chamber. No, that's not what but, I mean. Yes. <laughs> um, but we, uh, we, can say it we would ourselves. like to provide the same training to make sure that all users of the legislative information system uh, have the same understanding mm -hmm. of uh, what the vulnerabilities may be. And so this was uh, pre the pre-session that you did this, right? Um, yes. So this was um, the, no. the cybersecurity training was uh, the all house. It was the all house training. Uh, I was uh, preceded by Chief Romei uh, for a physical security training. Um, at that point, but it was in December. That's what I'm asking you. Or was I think it, it was really January. January. I think it was January. I'm sure it was early January. January. Okay. Yeah. So mm -hmm. all, all legislators were present at that yeah. point, and mm -hmm. uh, the speaker uh, invited us in okay. to uh, provide that training. Was that required? Yeah. I believe it was required by the speaker. Okay. Yes. Do we anticipate doing that again this year, even though it's um, the second I would, year? Of uh, I would welcome the opportunity to do the same refresher. Um, I think it would be great. I, I think it is beneficial to have the information provided. Uh, regularly and uh, uh, consistently. Is there any reason to think it wouldn't be happening this year? Um, I don't know. I, I hadn't given it a thought. I would made the assumption that we, uh, the speaker and I, would discuss it getting closer to see if it's something that she wants to dedicate time to again, uh, being the second year of a biennial, um, as everybody has already heard that information. But I, again, would welcome uh, the opportunity to come in one more time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. I, yeah. I agree, Laura. I think we. We could use it a second time around, even though people are... It's, it's something that even uh, IT professionals should be receiving, uh, again, regularly. Uh, the 
time frame, which you determine as regular, is always subject to the needs of the organization. Um, but uh, it, it's certainly um, something that I would like to see happen no less than annually. Uh, next slide, sir. Third party training. So uh, it, to supplement our in-house training, uh, we bring in and contract with third party uh, specialized trainers when we have large changes. Uh, so this year we had a Windows 10 upgrade, so we went from Windows 7 to Windows 10. We brought in a third party trainer uh, who does nothing but Windows 10 training to make sure that they could uh, teach uh, the staff the differences between those two operating systems. Um, it's uh, what we call a bit of a force multiplier, have that trainer in. It allows us to continue to do our day-to-day -day job um, without having to dedicate an individual or more than an individual staff member to that training while making sure everybody still receives it. Um, it is typically around specific technologies or specific subjects, and it is typically made only upon request either of, again, a large change or if the, uh, uh, a legislative body or a large staff unit have requested a, a specific training. Question. Moving on. So, um, training recommendations. Touched on it already. Uh, cybersecurity awareness training. I believe it should be mandatory and routine um, for all users of the legislative information systems. Uh, that includes legislators, staff, uh, and anybody that we allow access to include contractors. And we want to make sure that their systems are just as secure uh, and that they understand our security policies. Um, IT should periodically uh, audit and test user training. That's a, a nice way to say that we should send phishing scams to you and see if you bite on them and see what that, that um, um, response rate looks like, what that acceptance rate looks like. Maybe you said this, but are you already doing them in a routine way with staff? No. So cybersecurity awareness training is relatively new to the legislature. Uh, we received our first uh, dedicated position last year, not even quite a year ago, almost a year ago. Uh, Brian Torres is sitting behind me. I is our dedicated cybersecurity uh, uh, professional uh, that we have on the staff. Uh, so we are still building up this system. We're trying to, uh, we uh, also um, hired a new user support specialist this year whose primary duty is training. Um, unfortunately, we see some staff changes happening in the near future. Uh, so that is uh, on the back burner for the moment. Uh, once we get uh, through the next month or so, we will continue those efforts to try to bring a uh, training framework specific to cybersecurity to the staff as a whole uh, and the legislators as a whole. Is there a industry level of uh, bare minimums that you would like to see achieved by everybody within the building and that could be signed off as uh, uh, for contractors as we have achieved these minimums? And there is. Um, I don't have the specifics with me. Um, I would have to defer to uh, Ryan as far as uh, the specific cybersecurity uh, requirements we would have. Um, but we generally follow the NIST uh, 853 framework. Um, to make sure that our information systems are secure. We are still working through that framework and using that as a guide as we uh, evolve uh, as an uh, organization. Did you, did you want to bring Ryan? Did you want Ryan? Do you have anything to add at this point? No. Nothing to add. Okay. Um, so uh, it's something that we should be doing we haven't done yet, again, is uh, we, we need a bit of buy-in to be able to poke uh, at the, uh, the legislator specifically to send false uh, and potentially scary emails uh, to see if people uh, bite on them. Um, it's a great, great way to provide insight into how well that training is actually working. What would that look like? What would it look like? Yeah. Um, so we would use a, a commercial-based system to uh, craft an email that is uh, malicious in intent, uh, but safely malicious. Uh, it essentially says, oh, we got you. Uh, once you get through the end of the uh, clicking of those links, and it provides uh, some data back to us to analyze to make sure we understand what that click rate looks so like. So what's scary, the I gotcha the, or the text of the uh, original <laughs> message? Uh, so it's the I gotcha. It's, oh. it's understanding that you uh, uh, were susceptible to a phishing attempt. Okay. Uh, that, that, that can be uh, scary for some folks. Um, and we want to make sure that everybody's aware that it could happen, that we might send something out. Um, but we don't want to advertise it too widely, obviously. To fire drill. Mm -hmm. Fire drill. At the end of it, can we suggest that here's the training options that you can... Uh, Certainly. I, I, I don't see why we couldn't pursue it in that direction. 
for the individual who failed? Yes. <laughs> I just wanted to be clear. It's like detention. <laughs> I, I, I think I, I'm picturing myself trying to convince Senate colleagues that we need to do this, and, and I want to come back to the staff idea. It seems like that conversation goes easily when we can say the whole building has done this, and we, you know, I'm sorry, four months of work is not the excuse. We're now the weak link. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if, if you agree, but it, it seems like it could be something that would, we would, as a committee, suggest. But it sure would feel better for me if, if we were sort of saying, well, look, everybody's dealing with this. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, everybody has already gone through it or is scheduled or whatever. So is that a recommendation for everyone to do the training? Uh, recommendation? For yes, I mean, so so they're already working with everybody that works in the building, other than legislators. It sounds like. Oh, uh, we have not provided cybersecurity awareness training to all staff at this point. Right, but that's on the short list, list, right? You're saying list, yes, mm -hmm. and I'm saying when that's either scheduled or been completed, and then I think it gets easier for us to say to colleagues, where are the people? you know we gotta now it's time for us to do our part. Otherwise, I mean, if you have a weak link in the system, right? The, the whole system vulnerable. So absolutely. Really so, uh, uh, in my notes, I, I very specifically call that out. That uh, our IT infrastructure is only as strong as the weakest link, and quite frankly, it's the users of the system that are the weakest link. So when um, we uh, do the recommendation, I think it's important to put it in that context of the overall every user of the network mm -hmm. and um, and the potential risk um, that's right. posed. To that point, I, yeah. do you have any thoughts on people who haven't? Um, achieve this perhaps being firewalled from the rest of the network? Uh, so we take uh, many precautions uh, proactively uh, for what we call our risky users uh, to, uh, for lack of a better term, firewall them uh, from information systems that could be damaged. And who are your risky users? I will not identify risky users. Um, <laughs> what's the method then? Your methodology? Oh, are they Maybe oh, we so individuals? We have a lot of logging. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Yeah. They're, are they individuals? They're individuals. Or yes. they're not, it's, not like. It's not specific instance, groups. Uh, we anecdotally, anecdotally, um, the uh, risky users uh, span legislators and staff members alike. Um, so it, it is not a specific group that is worse than the other. You're so so you're firewalling, I want to make sure I understand this, specific individuals. There are times when we have to put additional security controls in place to protect those individuals from their usage patterns. Okay, so, uh, so I would like to understand a little bit more about um, when that determination gets made and how that determination gets made. Um, so it is at, typically after um, it, there's no set process. Okay. Uh, just so that's clear, there's no set process currently. It is a uh, operational decision uh, made after multiple attempts of typically educating that individual on some of the risky uh, usage patterns, um, and uh, it's not always uh, retained. Um, so that is something that we want to make sure we protect against. Multiple attempts. To, so, uh, there, but there's no there's no process. There's, so. there's no set in stone process currently. But the process is you identify it, you try to go to the individual yeah. and, um, yes. and have them correct uh, and, and stop that behavior. And then um, on that individual facts of the case, mm -hmm. you make a determination to firewall. Um, right. so, but we, if anybody on that list would know if you'd come to that person, individual, where they might be multiple times to say uh, this, what you're doing here, is creating a real risk for the network. Hmm. Is that what I, I think that's, that? that's a fair assumption uh, to make. Uh, so we, by default, go to the users first. We try to educate first, mm -hmm. and we try to do it multiple times. Yeah. Uh, we will never restrict access to the tools and um, um, information systems that they need in order to do their job. We will make sure that they have all the resources they need to do their job effectively. Um, I think what we ultimately need to do in order to prevent situations like this is an in-mass cybersecurity awareness training program. Okay. And that is mandatory and that is routine. Um, and that in the event that somebody refuses, uh, most information systems will then disable 
the account. Uh, most most organizations disable the account temporarily until that training is uh, requirement satisfied. And so you have the authority now to do some sort of fish fishing expedition with us. Are you or do you are you asking? That? Yes. Um, no, we do not have the authority uh, at this point uh, to do so. Uh, that is typically something we'd want a committee level buy in on before we start um, proactively uh, sending phishing attempts throughout our our network. So, authority versus comfort level. So you don't have the authority. Don't have the authority. I and am, you're uncomfortable. I am uncomfortable doing okay. it without uh, okay. the committee level buy-in. Okay. okay. Well, that's and prudent. You're not explicitly prevented from doing so. I am not explicitly prevented from doing it either. Um, there, there is nothing saying we can't do it. Uh, we certainly could, but it's it's uh, something that should be part of a holistic approach, a comprehensive approach. Uh, sound security. We don't want to be ad hoc. Okay. Do more? Well, I'm curious for you or, or for others. Uh, do these questions all fall to this committee or some of this alleged council? I mean, I, I'm just curious. I mean, we can obviously make recommendations. Nobody's yeah. passing a bill here, but I'm just curious where the jurisdiction is sort of shared. So my interpretation of the jurisdiction as of yesterday would be the Legislative Management Committee or the Legislative IT Committee. Right. I'm oh, good. IT or I'm on the Legislative Management. I'm on the Legislative IT. Oh, we got a <laughs> uh, And also, we and are... our chairs have gone by. Yes, yes. Uh, drafting. But you guys are going to take our committee away, I hope. I've yeah. heard. What we've talked about, right, when you create another structure and um, yeah. make that kind of change, we, as Kevin said yesterday, that yeah. everybody was in agreement IT needed to be yeah. a separate entity, and we moved on that yesterday. So um, we're looking at uh, other committees that have been created over time um, in light of this new, newly created so we just don't want to layer on something else on top of everything that's there. So uh, well, we I'm only one that. member, but I think it would make sense to be folded into. Thank you. That's consistent <laughs> with what I'm thinking. So. <laughs> uh, so we are working on a recommendation letter as well, which we'll talk with Becky about later today. Okay. So that would go to. So before we move on to the next slide, the biggest thing that we want to see as a training outcome is the improvement of your um, base level knowledge across the, the user base is what we call it. That way every, every user of the uh, uh, legislative system understands the base level of expectation when it comes to cybersecurity and what we call cyber hygiene. Just good practices on uh, how to be alert, pay attention, and report uh, what you see in, in an effective manner. Next slide, sir. Common concerns and vulnerabilities. Um, so this is uh, generic uh, to some extent, but this, these are issues we see across uh, the board uh, to include legislators and staff members. Uh, social engineering, um, that is uh, the art of having a conversation with somebody and extracting information that they otherwise wouldn't have given you. Um, we have had that happen here multiple times where we have outside uh, entities calling up uh, uh, perhaps the speaker's office and say, hey, I'm from Canon, and by the way, we need a, uh, a new supply of toner shift. Can you give us X, Y, and Z information? Um, all of that information should never go to the speaker's office. It's filtered through the IT department, so they immediately should be alerted uh, or tr triggered at that point, knowing that that is potentially a, a uh, social engineering or vishing call, voice phishing, uh, for that information. So. That, that's a, an area of concern. Phishing, email phishing, everybody is more or less aware of it at this point, um, what the concept means. That is a huge concern of ours. Um, the organization uh, receives many phishing attempts. Uh, some are, uh, I don't want to say necessarily successful at all times, but some get further than others do. Uh, there might be a first round of response, and then they go, oh, wait a second, this isn't accurate. This, this is not something that I should be responding to. Um, and we receive a lot of reports for phishing emails uh, from our users, which is encouraging. Uh, general malware. Uh, so general malware across information systems is obviously a big concern. Uh, you can get that from a variety of means to include attachments via email or downloading something you shouldn't be downloading, which is why we secure the information systems the way we do, is to try to avoid uh, those uh, pitfalls and to reduce the uh, opportunity for uh, threats to be introduced into the environment. Web, could, uh, could I ask a question along these lines? I've never fully understood this, but 
Is there a time when just having received the email is dangerous or is it always like then clicking the attachment or clicking the link? And is this is where I will bring Ryan to the table okay. to get into the very specifics of it. Okay. So Come on up, sir. Automatically. Yeah, I don't you know, you're like, oh, have I already, all I did was open the message, yeah. whatever. Mm -hmm. I didn't even open it, it just yeah. comes up, you know, yeah. email. Morning. I am Ryan Torres. I am the uh, Network Security Administrator um, for the Legislative uh, IT Office. <laughs> We, we don't have a name yet. <laughs> uh, to, to address the uh, specific question, um, the act of receiving email in, a, in and of itself is not a hazard. Um, depending on the configuration of the email client, there could be um, tracking pixels that I downloaded. Um, most modern uh, email browsers are set to disable that by default. That's why you've uh, um, probably seen that download pictures button. Um, so if that button is not pressed, the attacker has no idea that the email has been received, um, only that it was not rejected. And like on my phone, it'll preview a message, right? Is that sometimes bad practice in terms of triggering that stuff? Um, typically, no, um, so long as it does not download external content without user intervention. Well, that's, I've wondered that myself. Thank you for asking sure. that. Mm -hmm. I'm not afraid to look foolish. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, do, I do routinely. Um, okay, that, that's interesting. So, um, the greatest risk then would be um, in this it, it's downloading files that you're not sure of the sender. Is that, is that where, is that, if you were to look at where we might be at greatest risk? Would it be um, clicking on that, um, what? I'm sorry. Uh, clicking on that and downloading whatever it is that's attached. Um, well, that is a great risk. Um, that's not the greatest. The then. greatest single risk, risk is the phishing attack that is seeking to extract your username and password. Okay, all right. And that's usually a link that you click on or what? Um, it's a link, occasionally it's a piece of malware, but most often it is a link to a falsified web page. Is that like when I win gazillions of millions of pounds and um, that, that, and I could send them? Is moment, that an yeah. example? That, that, that's a potential moment. That, I get those that, all the time. Uh, I'm very wealthy. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's uh, specific to each message. Yeah. Uh, we'd have to analyze each message, yeah. but that is an example of okay. where you could have a situation where your credentials are compromised. Okay. Yeah, the, there's a difference between a scam and a fish. Yeah. That's really what I'm asking. Yeah. Um, so, like when you get the, you know, something from a bank, it looks official, your credit card or Amazon on your order, mm -hmm. that would come in scam bucket or is that phishing? It uh, again, it depends you, on I don't mind how it's saying, crafted. Uh, could you distinguish between the two because I'm not sure I'm clear. So, um, uh, I will try to create two separate examples using Amazon link. Okay. Um, so, Amazon. Uh, imposter email. So the first one is saying, hey, your order's on the way. Can you please confirm some information for us? Yeah. Um, they could turn around and say, uh, please enter your username and password in order to check your, your uh, order. Make sure that it's being delivered. Mm -hmm. That would be a fish. That's a phishing attempt. Or they could turn around and they could say, hey, your order was delayed because your payment wasn't processed. Please send us your payment information. Uh, Resend your payment information. That could be an example of a scam. Um, those are areas where they're trying to extract credit card information rather than access information. Um, information versus money. Right. Okay. So yeah. scam is money. Scam is typically money oriented. Okay. Hmm. Uh, Web-based attacks, uh, these are uh, less prominent but still a concern. Uh, as far as uh, Ryan was saying, our single point uh, that we would have to point to at this point is uh, phishing. Phishing is our, our largest concern. Uh, Web-based attacks, cross-site scripting, drive-by downloads, uh, insecure websites, uh, I won't get into the details, there are plenty of threats online uh, due to insecure web server hosting practices. Um, no organization is immune to web-based vulnerabilities, it's uh, how many layers of security do you have in place to make it uh, less um, interesting to an attacker. So I have, I have a question. Um, I got, I had sent um, Anson Tebbets an email, and he responded to me, and but on my uh, iPhone, it came in in Chinese, mm. the text. 
but when I went in on my home computer, it was, you know, I could have, it was just regular English. Um, what would it could be device misconfiguration? However, I would strongly it only happened to, uh, once to uh, send that as a potential issue to our IT team. We can talk about that afterwards. Oh, what? Okay. Look at it. Well, I think I deleted it. Okay, that's my uniform response to everything is delete. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but without seeing it, I don't have a good answer oh, uh, for okay. you. Well, However, that would be yeah. uh, that's pretty weird. It that's is pretty weird, and it, the fact that it was coming up on my phone that way. But it was, not on uh, but on, not on the computer. It, it could be uh, a device misconfiguration. Oh, or could be. It, it, it could they be want me to learn Chinese. Nothing. It could be something. Yeah. Well, all right. Well. My emails from him are fine. Password policy <laughs> awareness is another area <laughs> of uh, great you know. concern that we have. Uh, many organizations, uh, to include ours, are sometimes in the habit, for convenience, to share login credentials to information systems. Um, so let's, uh, I'm just pulling an example out of my hat, it's not saying it's true or not. Let's say a committee assistant is uh, out sick for that day and there's a pressing need in order to post content uh, to that, that committee's web page. Um, perhaps that committee assistant says rather than waiting uh, to get the proper uh, access, because everybody's containerized into the access they're supposed to have, um, rather than waiting to get that proper access, here just use my credentials, uh, get it uh, uploaded quickly and you know, call it a day. At that point, that person has now disclosed their password and their username to those other folks and it is no longer considered secure. Um, on all of our documentation, when we issue accounts, it explicitly states not to share credentials. However, we don't necessarily have enforcement tools uh, to make sure you don't share those credentials. Uh, that's an area of concern that we have and again, will be part of a comprehensive approach uh, in the short term. So how would you address that? In other words, there's a need to act. Mm -hmm. People get out sick. Um, do you have a, a redundant method so that um, that information could still um, be posted timely? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so we're in the process of changing some of these systems that we've had in place in the past, which may have been built uh, either ad hoc in nature or uh, hastily in order to meet the need. Um, so we want to make sure that those systems are uh, as secure uh, as possible and uh, provide the appropriate level of access regardless of the situation. Um, so that could be a change in web portal access, that could be a change in um, policy level access on the back end. It, it's, it's it something we can put technical components in place to take care of. Does, are you saying that the, the staffer for the Health and Welfare Committee can't post agenda items to the finance? I, yes. And so could it be as simple, because in every case we, we get covered usually somehow of just temporarily empowering the, 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 the substitute staffer. Mm -hmm. And that so, seems like that's really w usually what is in fact the workaround, right, is, is that probably the, the substitute is getting the password from the phone. Uh, so they're not at this point. Uh, okay. So we've worked out a uh, workaround process for that specific instance uh, to where we escalate the level of access for a short period of time. Um, it, it's not an ideal situation, but uh, it, it is a way to ensure that we are not sharing credentials. Uh, we never ask for credentials. We don't want your credentials. We don't want your password. If you give it to us, we're going to tell credentials you. Credentials are password. Username, password, and any anything type of, else. Uh, it, well, it depends on the system. Um, here in oh, like a secondary path, like we were talking about. Could be a secondary about. piece, okay. um, but it, it's whatever you use in order to access the information system, and that is tied to you as an individual. Um, we want to make sure that we maintain the privacy of those um, to ensure that everything is auditable uh, based off the user. So. Um, if somebody makes a system change, it should be, you know, noted that it was that person that made a system change versus somebody Use it and using it. those passwords and usernames. You so, mentioned that you don't have enforcement ability. So, uh, we what would that have, look like? So, uh, we have many working policies uh, that we've developed over the last few years. Uh, so, our organization obviously has. Uh, continue to change and evolve drastically over the last about five or six years. Um, so we now have a series of cybersecurity policies, but just general IT-based policies that have not been formally adopted uh, by the IT committee at this point. Um, that is a, uh, an area of uh, improvement that is necessary uh, to make sure that we can then refer to those policies um, for enforcement purposes uh, if we have a, a concern. 
Okay. We have many of them ready to go. Okay. And then, uh, as I've already touched on the last slide, cyber hygiene. Uh, feel free to go to the next slide, Mike. Uh, cyber hygiene is, it's just good paying attention. It's, you know, is this a scam? Is it a phishing attempt? Uh, do I use the same password in multiple locations? Don't do that. Um, do I use the same username? It might be appropriate, depending on what you're doing. Um, so those are the things we want to make sure that part of our cybersecurity awareness program, that people understand what that means, what it looks like to pay attention and ask questions and be skeptical at all times, specifically around phishing attempts and scams through uh, email um, or even phone calls, as I previously mentioned. Those, those are areas of concern. Um, to consistent um, vulnerabilities, I guess, uh, we get a, a number of emails that are presumably valid, um, either from the National Guard or from uh, surveys uh, that are looking for legislative input. Um, and from the National Guard, there's almost always an attachment of some sort, and it's never from the, the is there a way we can communicate to uh, groups that are in regular uh, contact with us you know, hey, stop doing that. That's setting people up for failure. So, having worked in a DOD environment, specifically for the Vermont Guard, uh, we can provide many points of recommendation, most of which will likely be ignored due to the policies that come down from uh, what we used to call Big Army. Um, so, they have very specific. Um, security frameworks in place that they must follow, that they have no control over. Um, so when they send an email, uh, it's going to be self-signed typically from their uh, system. You're going to see uh, you know, some sort of bad signature uh, potentially from that because they use their own certificate authority. Um, it, if you live in the DOD percent? environment, if you live in that, that Department of Defense environment, you'll never notice the differences. As soon as they're interacting with folks outside of their environment, that you notice it. Um, I am more than happy to engage them to see if there's something that we can do to make it a little more user friendly when it comes down to reading it and accessing it. But their policy uh, by default is to flag all external emails, uh, to disable all links, uh, to make sure that it is as difficult as possible to introduce any kind of uh, malicious uh, but attachment. how would we know when we're being invited to the F-35, is it, event? Yeah, the, the so, uh, not, uh, not, I are, think that's, is that what you, uh, as, okay. a, as a benefit, because you're talking about on the DOD side, but I'm talking about if I get something, how do I know it's really from the big army? Uh, so that's part of the, the, um, the training program, well, how to identify the actual sender address, make sure that it is legit. Um, mm -hmm. The other piece that we are uh, in the legit. process of rolling out um, through, uh, we've worked through one staff office, we're trying to get it through other staff offices as well, is a flagging of specific external emails. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it flags it, it in the subject line, it says this is external. At the top of your email, it says this is external. And then at the bottom, it gives you some very basic directions on what to pay attention to, um, attachments, links, things of that nature. Uh, so we're in the process of rolling that out and it will eventually be rolled out to legislators as well. Um, you should always be skeptical is what it comes down to. Always be skeptical. Uh, make sure that it is indeed from the sender that you uh, uh, believe it's from. If you were not expecting it, uh, don't open attachments. If you are concerned that that's an attachment that you might want to review, feel free to contact that sender either directly through a, a known email address or uh, uh, through a phone and say, hey, did you send this to me? Um, that, that's always a, an okay response. What I was getting at is a lot of those raise the same red flags that a fake email would. Yeah. So if people get in the habit of, oh, okay, this looks like it's from the DOD, I'll just click on it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That sets them up for failure because they're in the ha in a bad habit because mm -hmm. of the, the format from oh, yeah. the DOD. Yeah, and that's something that's pretty tough to try to handle <laughs> as a receiver of email. Yeah. Um, but uh, again, I, if that's something that the committee thinks is worthy of pursuing, uh, I'm more than happy to, to reach out and see if there's a way we can communicate a little bit better and try to clean that up. And we are all obviously getting, legislators are getting you know, tons of emails from people we don't know. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which is a bit unusual compared to. So, and it's a high profile organization. So, uh, because of the profile of the organization and the individual legislators, it requires uh, a higher level of vigilance. I think that there's one thing that we all need to be very cautious about. 
whether we're doing it electronically or whether we're just using pen and paper, and that is what you say, what you put in writing, and how you say it. Because uh, Ollie North learned that nothing ever is deleted. <laughs> and um, sometimes, you know, I was aware of um, some internal exchange. This was involving a, a, a state office. And um, it, under freedom of information, those kinds of documents can't, have to be released. And um, I think there's also a certain re sensitivity toward what you say and um, and the nature uh, of the communication because um, it can it, it can come back in a way that um, you may not have anticipated and so if you don't want anybody to see it or what you're saying you don't want to have other people to see don't say it you don't you better <laughs> you better have a you know go to the bathroom and have a conversation in there or something but um, it, it it's just something that um, we we need to be aware because I do think you you could probably you would have the ability to access anything that's historically on the network. Um, so uh, we frequently does delete really mean delete? It depends on the situation. Uh, <laughs> so if we are underneath a litigation hold for any reason, uh, we do have to retain uh, certain uh, content uh, based off of that litigation hold. Um, we frequently uh, only would express written consent of each uh, legislator, uh, uh, assist during Freedom of Information Act requests, Public Record Act requests. Um, we do not look at the content. We do not see the content. Uh, we uh, provide it to the attorney who then works with the individual legislator to uh, uh, address what that Because uh, we've all had those like. requests. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, but you have to sign before they'll help you, really? Or? You have to provide written, con written consent, yes. Just went through my files of sent or. Well, you did, right, but if you want staff to oh. be peeking, quote oh. unquote, you have to sign off. So they're not yeah, we doing have some it pretty without. powerful tools that uh, speed the, uh, the process up for legislators. Um, but because of the, the nature of those tools and what they can access, we want to make sure that we have that express written consent. Okay. Anything else? Other questions for Kevin? So could you refresh us what whaling is? <laughs> I know it's so, big fish. It's big no, fish. it's actually not a fish. Yeah, a whale is not a fish. But you differentiated between scam and fishing. Now tell so us the difference between, between fishing, and fishing and whaling. Yeah. So fishing ge is uh, generally targeted towards the masses. Whaling is targeted towards a specific Subgroup. person of uh, typically power in an organization of high, higher, higher. Individuals high or it could be a group. Uh, correct. It could be a group. It could be uh, generic in nature across the whole company for regular fishing attacks. Whaling is typically targeted in going after big fish. Um, so whoever has that higher or is perceived to have that higher level of access the, for what? Huh? Would they? Would you be the target? Of I am. Because I, I, you I have, am a target. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, I am a target. So any any IT organization is a target. So I heard you mention earlier, Kevin, that you may have some staffing challenge coming up. Yes. And I know you had some staffing challenges behind. Can you just give us an overall sense of what you're staffing? And we know that in general that's a okay. challenge. Can you just tell us a little bit about um, So the staffing is always a, a challenge for our department in particular. Uh, we're a pretty small uh, organization to begin with. Uh, we uh, all wear very, uh, we, we, we wear a lot of hats, uh, all of us, uh, at any given point. Um, so Ryan uh, is not only our network security administrator, that is his primary focus, period. But he also helps whatever we can help. Um, you'll see him down helping the user if necessary, if everybody else is tied up. The challenges we're facing right now are uh, retaining staff, retaining qualified staff, um, and making sure that we can uh, um, provide an uh, intriguing enough environment for them to want to come here. So you have here. a vacancy now, we or have, you anticipate a vacancy? We anticipate a vacancy coming up. Um, and. Uh, it's I have to be generic. Um, we anticipate it coming up in the near future. Uh, hopefully, we can readily fill it. It is not a high level position that we are, uh, are losing or anticipating losing, uh, so it should be a pretty easy fill. Uh, we do have one position that is vacant, and that is our session only uh, user support position, which we don't typically hire until end of November, early December. Okay. So uh, we are at full staff. Um, once we hire that other position in backfill, um, based off of the current 
um, number of uh, positions we have allotted to us. That, that has not been the case in recent years. If that has not been the case in recent years. So we were at 50% staff level earlier this year. Uh, we worked uh, fairly diligently in order to fill those positions. Um, you know, it, it, one loss, one person uh, out of our department is a big loss. Um, it, it takes a big hit. So we we, um, we frequently have concerns about um, uh, lack of coverage. So if somebody's sick, uh, we frankly expect them to still be available remotely uh, as necessary. Um, so Ryan is the only network security administrator we have. Uh, we don't have another one. Uh, Sean Allen is our only systems administrator. We don't have another one. I backfill and try to assist as best I can, um, but in the event that we lose one of those positions, that is a, a strategic uh, key loss uh, of our department. Simply we have the numbers, fill. there's no death. There's just no death. So, okay. So if we have something happening with the system at 2 a.m., how us. do you, how do you know? Uh, so we have plenty of monitoring systems. We get 2 a.m. wake-up calls from our own monitoring systems to say fix us now. Um, in the event that the monitoring system fails, well, we'll find out in the morning. Uh, but that doesn't uh, happen uh, frequently, if at all. Um, so we, we have... Is it frequently or at all? It, it doesn't happen frequently. Uh, we have, in the, his, in the past, we have had issues where uh, they were not identified via our monitoring systems and we came into not a crisis, but an issue that needed to be addressed promptly. Okay. How often did the 2 a.m. calls? I haven't had one in multiple years now. Okay. So that's considered that's pretty good. Pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> okay. Great. Yeah, we're gonna wrap up. We have uh, Karen here. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If folks have their devices, I've been uploading some new presentation materials to the Jai Talk website um, this morning. So if you follow along there, we're also making as much as many printouts as we can. Good morning. Good morning. Karen, we're going to put your presentation up on the big screen oh, okay. too. As you need to change slides, I'll try to keep up, okay? All right. Good morning, Karen. We have uh, we have about 45 minutes. Before. Thank you very much for coming in and talking with us. Well, thank you for for having um, me come in and talk to you. It's um, clearly a huge issue for local governments. Um, everybody, uh, businesses, government, and individuals need to be constantly vigilant to protect our digital information. And right now, uh, governments are uh, governments are targets for cybercrime. Um, we hold significant amounts of sensitive information at the local level, and cyber criminals want them. And many of our municipalities are clearly ill prepared to fend off attacks. Um, some of the issues that we have are equipment can be old, um, equipment can be very old. <laughs> Um, staff across a municipality, or actually I'm, I'm sure that Kevin may have talked about it earlier, um, can click on a phishing message that compromises the entire system. Passwords may be infrequently changed or inadequate. Towns may not have their own domain, but rather just a laptop and a password that they're working off of. And the, the, that's just kind of a smattering of the sorts of issues that we have. We also understand that the weakest link is the human being. Um, criminals gain entry to systems when you click on the wrong link, when you answer the wrong phone call, when you um, respond to the wrong email, um, when anybody's not completely suspicious about pretty much everything that comes into to the system. While there have been breaches due to human error at the local level in Vermont, um, we're not actually aware of any ransomware attack in Vermont yet. Um, the, the most recent example of a breach of security due to human error is the Norwich situation. Um, are you familiar with that? In Norwich, in, in Norwich, back in August. Oh, yes, you, um, yes, I, Norwich, I'm thinking of Norwich University. No, 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 the town of Norwich. Norwich. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I, they, I'm they received, uh, the, the finance director received several emails that looked like they were from the town manager. 
and as a result, she made four transactions to an unknown bank, which amounted to about $250,000 before the um, system was shut down. And uh, so the town is um, likely to recover from one of the banks about $80,000. The LCT, because we ensure liability for um, municipalities, is and because of the particular nature of that situation, is going to make up the difference, which amounts to about one hundred and seventy thousand dollars. Could I ask a question, Karen? Um, since the league carries the insurance that you just yes. referenced, usually insurance has certain requirements, mm -hmm. you know, like if you put in a stove, you have to have certain... Right. Um, yes. So are there requirements for that uh, liability coverage relative to training and um, what, what actions you have to take um, in order to sort of minimize that risk or loss? Well, so it's, um, it's a new area for us. It was 2018 when we first started offering the um, insurance to, uh, to municipalities based on um, risks created by software-based criminal activities. Yeah. But usually um, they, the insurer says, but we need to ha have assurances that you are doing X, yeah. Y, and Z. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, we do, we do a lot of training um, of local officials through passive. I don't know that there are, um, I actually don't know if we have requirements around um, multi-factor authentication, um, you know, upgrading your equipment, like ongoing training. It's something that we're starting to work on. This, this um, coverage was just offered beginning, I think I just said that, in 2018. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what? And um, let me just tell you, we, we insure 348 municipalities, um, ranging from fire districts to public safety authorities. We insure seven cities of the nine and 230 towns and 22 villages for liability. Mm -hmm. So um, clearly, it's a huge issue for us. It's getting um, you know to be more and more of an issue. Um, our coverage limits, I mean, we wouldn't be able to cover every situation that happened. You know, there are limits to, to coverage. Um, municipalities can buy up, they can buy additional coverage, but it's quite expensive to do that because we have to, I'm not an insurance person, but you have to work with the um, reinsurance market as well. So there's a lot of issues around that. Um, Karen? Yeah. So you talked about you don't have a requirement yet for any kind of training. Um, would that be, can you just help me understand what you would put that in place for accessing or participating in the insurance? Mm -hmm. Well, what we, would, what we do is we assess a town's risk and a town's losses, and that's what the cost of their insurance is based on. Okay. So if you have multiple losses due to um, you know, cyber criminal activity or um, inattention of staff, that is going to affect your, the, what you get charged in the following The individual year. town, not every subscriber, and it's town. not spread over the so, individual town. Mm -hmm. So this is not a commercial product then? This is just the... This the, is a risk pool for, uh, of municipalities, yeah. municipal governments. Mm. We are getting a lot of competition from commercial, you know, not to get sidetracked, but initially when we started the passive program, it was because um, private vendors were not um, interested in underwriting municipalities. Um, so over time, there are um, there are periods of time when the private vendors are interested, and this is one of those times. So, um, but we have a risk pool. Ours is a risk. Pool. What has the loss history been so far in Vermont? Do you know? Around this particular issue? Mm -hmm. um, we haven't had a lot of losses. Um, there was a situation in um, Essex where they, uh, there, there were two situations that I was told about yesterday, one in Middlebury and one in 
Essex. Essex was able to stop, halt the um, breach, and they really didn't suffer any damages. And in Middlebury, there was a falsified payroll um, check issued. I'm not sure exactly how, but it worked. It amounted to about $2,500. So um, we haven't seen a lot yet, but we we have no illusions that we are going to see more. And with regard to, I, I believe you said you're not aware of any ransom. Right. So I am of okay. a larger... Of a municipality. You know, um, several years ago. Okay. And so I wonder, I just wonder why, under, and they're active PLCT so people, Gilf, so... Guildhall or... Brett. Oh, no, Guildhall is... It's nothing to... Right. It's a grand <laughs> right. It's Essex yeah. County. Mm-hmm. Guildford. Oh, Guildford, that's what you're is Brattleboro? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I can find out for you. Well, no. I, I just I so I wonder to what. <clears throat> I just wonder. Recently, in the, in the last couple of years, yeah. Oh, okay. So I'm wondering what to what extent municipalities are sharing that information. Well, I mean, if they want to, if they're a member of Passive and they want to recover their losses, they have to um, tell us. <laughs> We're not going to pay them yeah. if they don't tell right. us. Right, but this may have predated. You said so, this was 2018. So, so actually, exactly. yeah, exactly. that is true. No, I think that's yeah. exactly it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so I will find out more so details Karen, about how, that. How does the, the league... Because when you talk about how many entities out there, mm-hmm. um, and not all of them are obviously participating, as you right. say, in this yeah. risk pool, um, how how do is there some um, organized way of getting information, cautions, alerts um, out to your membership, um, and or uh, training opportunities? Yeah. Because it. Just from the examples you've given, it, it shows it's sort of mm-hmm. a, right. occurring in a variety of ways in a variety of towns, and um, everybody is sort of got. A, um, we're in a different world here than yeah. even five years ago. So yeah. I was wondering what what you have in place uh, to uh, to make people better informed um, and um, how to uh, alert all the membership that this just happened in, like Essex, yeah. for example, where it was avoided because people being vig- vigilant, yeah. but it could be happening multi- in multiple areas. So we we do have, um, uh, we have a page on our website now that is um, technology assessment, learning about your systems, and has a number of links to vendors who will do security audits. Mm-hmm. Um, I gave you some of this information. I actually have copies also. Um, That's like New Harbor, for example. The um, our keynote speaker at our annual meeting this year was um, Morgan Wright, who's a, a cybersecurity expert. And they need more. Um, and and we followed up that with. Um, Do you remember with this? No, same thing. It's. It's, it's more copies. Same. It's more copies. We made more? ten copies. I wasn't oh. sure who was going to be here. I guess it's an expert then. Um, we, we've been trying to uh, develop some kind of collaboration with Champlain College, their um, Patrick Lee Center for Digital Investigation, um, and provide training through there. There's a training on October 22nd. We're not actually, um, I guess the person that we were working with at the Municipal Assistance Center um, left Champlain College, so we have to sort of re-up those conversations now. But um, uh, we've hosted a webinar just this week on computer security awareness with KnowledgeWave. We have about um, 80 participants on on that who who are local officials. The issue is, um, you you know, you may have two people that are watching the webinar might not be, it's likely not the public words director or the, mm-hmm. you know, and all those people um, add to the vulnerability of a, of a system. So, and um, we have an online university that is for uh, 
the members of PASSIVE, the, the liability insurance program. And that gets, that's an ongoing thing. We've had it for quite a few years. Cybersecurity is one of the issues that they address around loss control. And we've had um, a very good response rate to that, to those kinds of classes. Um, the National League of Cities just issued a new publication uh, protecting our data, what cities need to know about or should know about cybersecurity. And I think I gave, I sent that to Mike also if you want to take a look at it. It's, sh it's okay. short, um, but it does hit kind of the, the things that cities and towns really need to look at. This um, is up on the website, Karen. Should well, we look at what you he want to look at? It, it, he posted it. There were a couple of. Um, that it is on the website, yeah. And it talks about um, efforts on the part of some other states, uh, Georgia, West Virginia, New York, and Virginia, to help fund local government security mes measures. Um, it also um, talks about things that individual cities need to do, uh, identifying one person to be responsible for your cybersecurity in your town, educating your workforce, which is going to be a never-ending job, um, analyzing your vulnerabilities on your system, uh, backing up your data on a regular basis, all those kinds of things, multi-factor authentication. Um, we're actually doing that in our office right now, um, and planning for managing potential attacks. So that you have a you know you have a, a plan of what to do when you actually do get attacked. And Karen, did you want a different? Um, I'm sorry, it's from. Do you have the NLC um, report the there? The yeah, other presentation. Yeah, the re there's a report. Yeah, that. Yep. So um, and down it's oh wow that thing's big. Um, so down um, at like page 21, it, it, I think it has the recommendations for what towns need to do. This one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. yeah, see there's six there. Um, and on the printed copy, I also gave you an article from the Georgia Association of Municipalities around the same idea, what towns really need to do. Um, so we, we have to do, um, I, I think in order to be successful to your um, issues, Senator, we have to do a lot more. We have to do, you know, we have to get all of our members trained. We, we have to um, have equipment that is, um, that can support the, the software improvements and um, so forth. I mean, we were told the other day that only Microsoft 10, I believe, is going to be supported going forward. And um, I guarantee you there's municipal computers out there that aren't going to be able to make that shift. So there's um, a lot that needs to be done. Uh, I did talk to the Agency of Digital Services yesterday, to John Quinn, and, and they have some ideas. Um, but we're hoping that, um, and, and we're happy to meet with, to uh, work with you, but we're hoping that what you um, decide to do involves in s assistance um, versus mandates that um, a lot of towns aren't gonna be able to actually accommodate. Right. So um, it's really a different kind of issue area. And we also, um, just one other um, thought, we've been working with the Department of Taxes and Jill as they put together a request for proposal. Jill Remick? Yeah, Jill. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would just want to make sure it was. Oh, yes. Jill. Just coincidence. <laughs> um, as they put together the RFP and received uh, responses to the RFP for a new modern integrated property tax management system that incorporates security measures. And, and that's a significant interface between the locals and the state, so that's also mm -hmm. a potential vulnerability. Okay. This is fascinating, and I, I feel like it's such a timely discussion. Mm -hmm. Ideally, we might have had it five years ago, but but better now than in five years. And I'm thinking about our shift in vital records mm -hmm. yeah. uh, in the last few years where we have, I would hope, because we are sort of centralizing that through the Secretary of State's office, I think. No, Department right? of Health. Department of Health. Health. We're, we're sort of, in a sense, um, 
I would guess, making that slightly less vulnerable since it's mm -hmm. less directly under control of the 200 whatever towns. Yeah. And, I, and I'm wondering, um, it, it, it is, from a budget point of view, not going to be realistic to, to expect all towns to jump into best practice right. technologically. And, yeah. and I wonder if the league and in your discussions have thought about places where we could create one system that towns then hinge mm -hmm. off of and, and that therefore, you know, the best practice and all the security. Like a single network? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, there, there would be some pushback. Yeah. People want to have their own uh, flexibility, but on the other hand, we, we're, we're I, I'm just trying to think of how you get around it, and it doesn't make a lot of sense when so much of this can be cloud-based to have it be you know, mm -hmm. in in municipal buildings located ten miles apart from each other, all throughout this, the state. I, I guess I'm just wondering if you guys have had or started thinking about ways that we might look to to take the the data that's most vulnerable and and pull it into some centralized system that towns could then access. Um. We haven't really thought in that direction, although another example of that would be the parcel mapping GIS mm -hmm. um, uh, program that has been ongoing for the last few years. Uh, I don't know if we're, uh, I mean, I'm also not an IT person, I don't know if we're ultimately safer having everything in one place versus dispersed. Um, mm -hmm. So, I guess my short answer right now would be no. We haven't actually thought about that a great deal. And, I, and I'm not. A, maybe it's not the right solution. But just sort of, when you look at it, the, the the prospect of going town to town to update individual systems seems really unrealistic and very yeah. expensive and and inefficient. And, but you're going to have to do. I I think you're going to have to do that anyway if, if municipalities are going to be accessing those. You know, the central location. Well, well, clearly there's a training element to it, but adding, so training, that's a big deal, but adding to that then system development, you know, upgrades and, and ongoing, because because at the end of the day, a lot of small towns are going to be run by a very small number of people, and maybe you get in there, get them practiced, mm -hmm. but do we really think that they're then, you know, able, just have the bandwidth to, to be yeah. upgrading their software? You know, all of these ongoing things that, I, I don't know, it, 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 it strikes me that there would be a role maybe for the state to come in and help and, and work with the league. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have no idea, but please don't misunderstand me, I don't know if that's the solution, but the yeah. point is just the sort of broad thinking of how do we come together and do this for, you know, the great majority of our tiny municipalities. Yeah. I, I don't have a good answer for you um, right now. Uh, one thing that also occurs to me is that the Department of Taxes actually does training for listers, you know, mm -hmm. around the grand list. And I believe that's required now. Yeah. So. They don't have to do it, but we are required to. Okay. If you want to get, I, I think there is a hook there somewhere around um, reassessment well, dollars or something like that. But um, yeah, so I, I guess I would ask. You mentioned, you know, please could the state help us rather than just mandate something? And, and mm -hmm. I, I respect that. I, I think it's prudent of you. Also, you're quite surprised today, weren't you? I'm not <laughs> yes. surprised, but, yes. but if you, you know, as we're having these conversations, I just hope we will be thinking of, like, where do we really want to be in five years, as opposed to what can we do right now because we're in shambles, and, and, and yeah. try to have that conversation so that, so yeah. that we're just sort of... I don't know if we're in a shambles, well, um, but... Another area um, that, that's been in the news quite frequently is around elections and voting machines, yeah. and, and um, so there's that whole issue, and I think that the Secretary of State maybe um, optimistically said that our, our system was more protective because it was dispersed, and you have to figure that out, yeah, so sure. that. but I mean, I don't know. Well, they're not online. 
that's a big the um yeah and the the yeah, right. really yeah. sort of scary thing is what's the next thing that comes down the pike it's changing all the time right so, so that's actually leads to a question that I have, um, which is, what is the entity um, at VLCT, what is that structure that's kind of grappling with this issue? Do you have like a subcommittee? Is it? We have, um, at, at VLCT, we have our Municipal Assistance Center, which is um, three attorneys and um, three other staff people. Um, we have our own IT staff that um, have moved us to the cloud and um, given us multi-factor authentication. And so, uh, and also the leadership team that are all sort of involved in um, uh, trying to address this issue, not only for our office, but on the municipal level too, for cities and towns. It affects pretty much everything you do. I mean, you know that. Yeah. yeah. I have another question that I'm that I'm wondering about, which is if you have any sense of um, uh, risk varying with uh, the size of towns, or or if there are typical problems that start to emerge with different size towns or concerns. Is that anything that you're looking at? Um. Well, clearly larger towns have more capacity to put protections in place. Um, and uh, to Senator Pearson's comment, the smaller towns, you know, you're usually operating with a very small number, number of people. So, so that's an issue. On the other hand, I mean, larger towns are likely to have larger losses when somebody gets through. So. Um, although probably not, I, I mean, they'd be debilitating in any municipality. If you look around the country, so in Texas this summer, there were 23 um, towns that were hit with ransomware, and they all had a common vendor for their cloud, and that's the, the, the um, malware came in through the cloud vendor and then went out to the 23 towns. Um, well, it's good to know that cloud vendors covering their losses. <laughs> <laughs> and there, if around the country, uh, Augusta, um, Georgia, and, and um, Maine, I guess fairly recently had a um, had an attack that was they were able to stop. I mean, the state of Maine. So there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot of lessons to be learned out there right now. One of the questions that I had asked you before this meeting was if the LCT had conducted a statewide assessment of risk um, for four well, municipalities. We haven't. We we have we don't have the capacity to do that right now. Um, you know, it would be that would be a huge job. Right now. Do some of the towns though actually retain uh, services of a. Um, there are these companies that come in yeah. and do that kind of. Um, yeah. Um, uh, do you know if that's happening with some, or is oh, it, it is just more in, it is in a proactive way as opposed to responding? Yeah, yeah it is absolutely yeah. happening the, in some towns. It seems like the um, where the experience has been is really on the financial side mm -hmm. to date uh, yeah. with the towns is trying to, like mm -hmm. that happened in Norwich or attempted in Essex right. to. Um, so you're dealing with. You're dealing with, um, so, yeah, I'm just wondering, like, how much of it is on the internet versus just internal um, uh, IT support? If, you know what I'm saying? In other words, is payroll, mm -hmm. I would think, would be, I don't know, maybe it's not. Is it, well, well, how that, are they that is a question internal? Those kinds of internal financial functions, as opposed yeah. to what's your internal risk and what's your external right. risk. Uh -huh. So, and and towns again, it sort of covers the spectrum in terms of um, towns that have done assessments of that or not. So, yeah. Is there um, any information on the the median cost per user for IT and cybersecurity? Um, among the towns? Uh, um, is there an idea of the spread, high to low? 
I, I'm, I'm sure there is. I'm not sure I can get it for you, but I can try. Okay. Yeah. So, Karen, Secretary Quinn was not in here when I asked you that previous question about yeah. a statewide assessment. And so, I, uh -huh. I actually, um, what I've asked is if the LCT has considered doing a statewide risk assessment um, for municipalities. And uh, Karen's response was that they don't have those types of resources. And I'm trying to really understand and think about um, what state interest there might be in having that type of assessment. So we've talked about several functions, taxes, elections, parcel maps. Um, and so, I, you know, I'm not gonna, I am sort of putting you on the spot, but I'm not expecting, um, I don't know if you have any thoughts or anything to add in terms of something we should know that the state does in terms of assessments or if that's something maybe to come back, but I just wanted to connect you to that conversation for the future at least. Okay, so for the record, I'm John Quinn, the state CIO. Um, I'm recalling a Department of Homeland Security grant probably six months ago. I, I'm not sure if it was awarded or not. I'm, I'm, there was money there to do um, local assessments, um, at least at a, at a high level to do a survey to towns um, and provide some guidance. Um, I haven't heard much about it lately, but I can certainly check into that and see where it was awarded and um, who received the, the contract to help with that work. This was and in Vermont? This department? was in Vermont, yes. The Department of Homeland Security grants all run through public safety. Okay. Um, and I just wasn't uh, part of the conversation the last couple of months. Okay, so what I, just to follow up, what I think you're saying is there was grant that came in that you believe had some assessment of municipalities yes but you don't have really a further understanding in that and you're going to come back to us and I will us. okay how can we do that without the municipalities knowing or well, well, maybe we don't it just hasn't started everything oh. you don't know everything <laughs> oh, oh everything. really oh, oh. Well, if somebody took advantage of it, that's wonderful, and yeah. it would be nice to know what other resources there might be in that area that we could, through Karen's organization, yeah. Yeah. encourage other towns to take advantage of. Or sometimes you get a grant and it takes a little while to start up. Too. Right, right, sure. Yeah. But we need to find out the experience maybe, of it. Yeah. So and maybe it's just. Can you do it again? Uh, in that. Work and maybe no one bid on the work. I'm not. I'm not quite sure. We thought about being able to do it, see, seeing if we could do it internally, but because of the way the funds were, we couldn't. We're a build back organization, ADSs, so it was hard for us because it would have had to have been free. We couldn't have used the grant to pay for our people to do it. It was a little complex, and that's why I'm aware of it. But um, I can. I can find out if it was awarded, and if so, to who, and see what the next steps are. Yeah, I would like to flag this conversation to revisit this conversation in November, both <coughs> if you're available, Karen and John, uh, think Secretary Quinn, thinking about um, what availability, particularly where we have these state systems. So um, Senator Pearson, I believe, was, was speaking earlier about, you know, networking, what consistencies I think that we could offer. Um, well, or, or opportunities, I mean, rather than every town investing in their own system and analysis or consultants or whatever, surely there would be some efficiency and in many cases towns might be happy to have that kind of assistance. Right. I mean, I, I, just, I just don't know, but, I, it, but thinking about this process repeating 270 times or whatever it is, yeah, it's, 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 it's crazy to me. I'm thinking in terms of the functions, though, of, of the system, for example, even in the state, um, the fiscal and the disbursement um, and mm -hmm. payroll is done through vision. It's done through, you know, so central, yeah. But it's not, it's different. It's like, for example, we get paid through that system vision. It has nothing to do with our legislative network. I'm just wondering if there's certain right, um, uh, functions that lend themselves, like you were talking yeah. about, to particularly where they are. 
connecting back into state systems mm -hmm, right. as we've talked about. So um, it's kind of interesting to see where those opportunities might be. It sounds like we're doing that, we're exploring that with property tax. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, a memoric system that's being used by most towns, I would think you would, would want to make sure that it has some kind of a cybersecurity component to it because all of the towns are booked, or many of the mm -hmm. towns that's are booked. Right, they are. Well, everybody uploads their grand list through the system. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's already these common systems that, and, you know, I, I guess part of it, <coughs> as we're following up, is what are those systems that we already have? Yes. Who's sort of in charge right. of them, and and is that something the state should be mm -hmm. aware of and, and potentially help with? Yeah. Are you, are you getting that? That so we're talking about following this thread in November. Mm -hmm. well, you know, I'll make sure I send Karen and John invites and. Um, I was just going to point out that the Vermont Center of Geographic Information, which is a division of ADS. Yeah. Um, they're a mapping group yeah. um, in all of the towns use uh, their information so that's one area that we sure we certainly share that service out um, to the municipalities another area that is in education is we're we're building that uh, unified chart of account system where oh, we'll yes. be able to uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, yep. am I going to See it before I depart my earthly existence. Oh I hope so. Martha Heath was chair of uh, <laughs> appropriations yeah. when we set that money aside to get a uniform. Is that the, true? Yes. Well, no, I'm that's serious. That's six a long, years ago. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's yeah. been a while. Yeah. Speaking well, there has been so a uniform chart of accounts for many, many years. The problem was the municipalities each used it differently. And so the accounts were uniform, but what was in them was not. <laughs> we'll get there. In, in the case of education, I don't think it was. Well, I guess you're right. It's what bucket they put in. So. It's like tangent, but related to GIS. Uh, and probably it'll be short. Um, do you know if they're using the uh, UVM drone survey folks to get a uh, full map regularly of the state? Um, I'm not sure if they're using the, the, the drone group or I not. I think they're using LIDAR. I think they're, they're using, using the LIDAR, use, LIDAR, LIDAR satellite. They've got higher resolution satellite. Every year you fund a little bit of satellite photography. Yeah, okay. That's in the Capitol Hill, usually. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Karen, is there anything else that, is there any, uh, one of the other questions that I had asked you, um, well, I had asked you about training. Um, you know, if there was an opportunity, and also what the legislature and the administration could do to right. be helpful. You've you've said you know, mm -hmm. not mandate, which. Yeah, well, we. Not. I mean, I think the, I think the biggest need is for funding for training because, that's the weak link is the the people, mm -hmm. you know, and you need to train on an ongoing mm -hmm. basis, like we get. So once a month, at least once a month, they might do it more frequently, but we get um, like fake email, you know, test emails. Um, and if you click on them, um, that, that goes back to the IT department and they um, come talk to you about the things you You're talking about town, for towns? No, we're doing it within our office. office. Within your office. But, your office. but yeah. you know, that's Saturday one of the best practices that you would yeah. put in place. And we've just heard that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, certainly. actually, when you think about this, though, this discussion is pretty expansive because they're, uh, while we're talking about local government, in fact, state government funds so many um, service providers. Right. Mm -hmm. um, for example, oh, yeah. our designated agencies are essentially um, um, uh, quasi judicial entities. And you, um, so the whole issue around security is. Um, it's pretty universal as we're, you think about it. I mean, um, we have a, a lot of money, millions and millions that are going out through um, through those provider systems. Mm -hmm. um, and um, a lot of them are, there's well, I think we, the cost of training, the cost of every, you know, of, of IT systems is, for example, our DAs right now are all in the process of getting mm -hmm. new, um, uh, health information systems mm -hmm. records and um, um, how they are 
well protected is right because you talk about sensitive information and um, at least we've limited it to two as opposed to what we had with vital which is anything that is meaningful use well i think i recall discussing that in a, one of our previous meetings in terms of yes how the state government's resources go out into these other organizations and that maybe we needed to look at it in terms of AHS, in terms of their master agreements with these organizations that what kind of cybersecurity issues do you have, Mr. Designated Agency? Because we're going to be funneling stuff through you and we want to make sure your organization is as secure as, as we would like it to be. And it should be part of that master contract negotiation. New rules, perhaps. Or well, the question is expanded how rules. I don't know if they they may already be there. I don't know, mm -hmm. but we just want to assure ourselves that there is some protection there. I, I'd be curious when we follow up on this if if people think it makes sense to ask Karen to touch base with your. You said there's a subcommittee of your board or whatever that, yeah. that, that looks into this and well it's mostly staff at this point well yeah. if, right. if maybe we hear directly from them or or mm -hmm. they join you or something because um, mm -hmm. i do think i don't have a good handle on the opportunity for the state to, to help or mm -hmm. like you know I, I you've made us aware that this is a considerable concern but um anyway it, it, yeah. if, if that made sense if you think that makes sense of I would appreciate it. Yeah, you know, I think what I'm kind of trying to put together in my, my head here is where the state is already intersecting with municipalities consistently, um, what opportunity there is for, for a statewide assessment of risk there. Do you understand? Uh, for the record. Sure. I'm Jill Remick. I'm Director of Property Evaluation and Interview at the Tax Department. So as part of our rolling out our brand list software, which I'd love to come back and talk to you about, because I do think it kind of represents a seismic shift and a pretty big opportunity to move towns in the right direction. We did an informal technology assessment because we're basically going to have sort of minimum standards that they're going to have to meet the local level to use the system. So I'd be happy to bring that back to this group if you'd like. Can you? That would be great. Okay. Um, we did an informal technology assessment. Right, so we surveyed towns. We actually um, had a researcher at the LCT help us make sure we got to all the towns and ask them. So things like bandwidth, um, age of hardware, things like that. Uh, yes. Um, it's not probably to the level that someone who is actually doing an IT audit would want to really know what's vulnerable, but it sort of sets the standard of what we've got. I mean, that seems to me like it would be useful information. And I'm not sure every town participated, but that we had over 50%. So. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do we want to take a quick break? Um, Cass is next. And Dan is Darren here? Yes. Darren's here. Um, and I think Cass is out in the... She is. Yeah. Yep, they're all here. So do you want to break now? Do we want to start now or do we want to take a quick break now? Quick break. Quick, quick break. Okay. Madison, Deputy Commissioner at DIVA and Program Sponsor for IE. For the record, uh, Darren Prail, Director of Digital Services for the Agency of Digital Services. The first one? Uh, yes. This one? Yeah. Okay. And do you have a printout that I can look Everyone at that? Since there's no iPad to scroll through, that way I can yes. Aaron, talk to it. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and yeah. 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 And yeah. the Agency of Human Services, and was with the Agency of Human Services before we consolidated IT into digital services. OK, yes. OK. Because we have you listed as the IT director for the Agency of Human Services. Mm. That, well, <laughs> it's assigned to the agency. I know. Okay. I understand. Okay. Yes. okay. We're going to, so, I want to get us going on your presentation to make sure that we're able to get through and ask. That sounds great. Okay, so just uh, very quickly on the leadership transition, just so you all know. Um, obviously, every time we testify, we have both AHS and ADS in the room. Um, on the AHS side, uh, program sponsorship for integrated eligibility will be taken over by Lori Collins, who has been with the state for 40 years. She also oversees the MMIS, Medicaid Management Information Systems IT project, um, and uh, she's the chief operating officer for DIVA. So they're sort of working out the organizational structure, but she'll be at the head of it. 
I think there are some really clear advantages to that. Um, on the federal side, they've moved to a consolidated model. So we used to have a separate state officer for each one of our major IT projects. They have one now just for Vermont. So I think having one person on the AHS side and one person on the CMS side is actually a really good thing. Um, so I think the commissioner will figure out uh, with the secretary of ADF how testimony will be handled going forward. But um, from a, a project management and sponsorship perspective, it'll be Lori. Okay. So I have a question. Um, are we in the process of rebidding the MMIS? Um, uh, we did that, get, we postponed it, and I'm just. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're taking so a modular we, approach to MMIS yeah, as, well. as well. And okay. so they've just you know, implemented a few modules and they're working on them piece by piece. So I think it'll be good to have that vision okay. coordinated. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so. Um, maybe. I'm assuming everybody knows what MMIS is. That's the Medicaid Management Information System. It's the claim, claims uh, payment. It used to be EDS years ago, and now Hewlett Packard. DXC. Uh, yeah, it's been changed yeah. over time. So yeah, but it's all the technology. But it's what pays the providers uh, for Medicaid beneficiaries. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so I have two, we have two things prepared for you today. One is the executive summary, which is um, basically the first two pages of the November 1st report, uh, which is complete and will be released to you all later today so that you have a chance to have plenty of time to review it and ahead of the, making a recommendation to joint fiscal. Um, and then I have some slides that just walk through like the high level things that we talked about last time that we wanted to make sure to hit on today. Um, so um, the, on the summary, you know, not, not a lot has changed since the last time we talked. It hasn't been very long. Um, essentially, what you see on the, on the color-coded chart is what we saw last time. Um, all, of the other, all of the projects, with the exception of business intelligence, are on track and in the green. Um, I think mean, the last time we talked, we had um, just gone live with our enterprise content management system on base and that that launch is going what continuing to go well um, we're just trying to finish up some remaining security items on that project and that project is slated to close in November um, we'll get into a little bit more detail on uh, in the slides on the business intelligence topic because I know that's one you all are interested in um, and then the the two big projects that are starting up online application and premium processing are going well. The vendor kickoffs for those projects happened this past week, so successful procurement, vendors are on the ground, and now that work, that development work is starting in earnest. So uh, good news there. Um, so I won't spend any more time on the report itself. We can go through the slides, but the, it's, you know, those are the big takeaways from that, from that executive sure. summary. Yes. I noticed, Cass, on your fourth or fifth bullet point here that CMS has approved the cost allocation. Yes. That, to me, seems like an important thing. It is, and I have a slide or two on finance oh, okay. specifically that we'll get to in a few okay. minutes. Good. Yeah, that was sort of hanging out there. Right. I was a little, a little worried about that one. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. So if we go to the second slide. May I just ask a question sure. before we get to I'm looking at the color-coded slide uh, regarding project performance mm -hmm. and the comparison of estimated project spend and current projected spend. Mm -hmm. And I haven't done the math, but as I look through what appear to be higher than anticipated project spend and then compare it to what's lower, just my eyeballs tell me that the estimated, the original estimated is 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 lower than the pro is, is is lower than the project spend. Is that right? I didn't see a total here is what yes. I really asked. Yeah, so there's a couple things to note. So the legislative report asks for um, report outs in very specific projects. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't ask for an analysis of the overall of the total. IE budget, although we have that. And I one of the things I'm leaving the team with is all the backup budget documents for um, actual financial testimony that will likely take place in January. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing to know about these numbers is these, are, these project numbers bridge fiscal years. So it's not a one-to-one. -one. If you look at, you can't just like add all of them up and then compare it to our appropriation. The projects bridge years. Um, the high level uh, readout on where we are is that even though the costs of some of the individual projects are higher, we've been able to live within our means. So the fiscal year 19 budget closed out and we underspent by just about $100,000. 
um, the analysis that we have on fiscal year 20 is that we're going to be able to meet all of our commitments, um, you know, pending the resolution of some of what happens with BI, but within the budget that we've been appropriated. Um, for fiscal year 21, um, we're about $200,000 short if we get the full appropriation based on what we're currently projecting, but we believe we can manage that because the one thing that we've seen year to year is that we always underspend. So I think you know, the staff on the ground tend to overestimate the amount of staffing time, for example, that we're actually going to need on the project. So we see staffing hours come in lower, stuff also you know, you move slower than you anticipate. Some invoices come in later than you anticipate. So, and I think we talked yeah. about this um, in September. Yes, mm -hmm. like we we right now feel like we are in good shape with what we asked for and being able to deliver on our commitments within well, where that my budget. My discomfort lies is as I look at, at projects, I, I I really would like to see where we're saving this money if virtually every individual project that we're measuring for this is over, I can't figure out where the savings are. And I haven't seen anything that effectively summarizes the detail and add the two fiscal years together to show me what we're spending and what we're saving, in other words, where the money is coming from that represents uh, the ability to come on budget when the individual key projects, most, if not all, seem to be over budget. We have all that data. Yeah, and so. I, I'd like to see that. Sure. I'd like to see, that, like on one piece of paper, a summary that really gives me comfort that I understand what I'm looking at. And so what you're looking to understand, Senator, is, so we see that these projects, I want to make sure I'm clear, yeah. these projects, um, most of them are over their projected Some spend. of them are twice their original yes. budget. Yes, and so what, and what my understanding is, is we are not, however, going over budget in the budget year, that these projects are taking place over fiscal years. So what you are asking for is to see how we're managing that over multiple, how we've managed that over multiple year budgets. Sure, I'd like to see, for example, if, okay. if, if these are over, what's under it? Yes, so over multiple years of dealing with this. Yeah, in I mean, fact, you can we, take the fiscal years, the, yeah. the, the two yeah. th that we're looking at, and list them separately and then show us a total. Yes, and I will just say that the reality of this, of, of budgeting for these projects is that at any point in time, the projections are like constantly being updated. Mm -hmm. And so we have to pick some very clear points in time. So if the question is, hey, when you guys came and presented a budget to us, in January of 2019, here's what you said you would spend line by line, and then where did you end up at in July of, or sorry, in January of 2018, and where did you end up in July of 2019? Like, we just need to pick those concrete points in time. Um, we have all of that data and can share that with you, as well as um, we have line by line with paragraph explanations for every line item for what we're projected to spend in the next two fiscal years. I think the challenge is that you know, you create these projections before the project starts. So it's your best guess of what you're going to need, and that every single week you're updating that based on new information. Sure. So, with a forecast, yeah. obviously, we know that forecasts change uh, over time, but at the point in time in which we're trying to do an evaluation to understand how the project is going, it's helpful to understand if we started out with an overall budget for this project as defined as integrated eligibility. How much did we project that we were going to spend? At some given point in time, how much have we spent so far? Yes. And then based on what we know right now, what is the forecast as to how we will end up when this project is done? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then of the individual elements of the project, what's over and what's under? Understood. That should be so the, in the effect some total is, is in the long form report that you'll be getting this afternoon. So okay. it has Hey, our projected budget was actually 16 million in, in fiscal year 2019, and we spent 10. Mm -hmm. So it, those numbers are there, as well as what we're projecting to spend in gross okay. and state share for the next two fiscal years. We have what we can do is get the budget detail to the committee that's behind it. Okay, and I want to just once uh, I want to clarify again, what I'm hearing you ask for is also a forecasting. Of I what am we're asking for forecasting. So that is a, okay. Yep. And that's something that you can also provide. Yeah, I mean, I, I would have to go back to Sarah Clark and ask what is the plan for the BAA for the capital bill, and like when is that information, when is it appropriately appropriate to release that information? 
given that this yes. is your last day. Yes, they have all make the... sure we connect with you and okay. Mike. Sure. About who Mike should follow up with. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, if I just want to um, understand what Senator Brock is saying, some of which you can manage be just because of cash flow and the way mm -hmm. um, timing comes in, but I think if I understand what you're saying is at the end of the day, at knowing you're going to have these variations and, and crossing fiscal years, if we thought the program was, you know, that, that the work was going to cost $15 million, and at the end, whatever, when completion, it comes in at 18, for example. So some of this just shucking, you know, uh, that occurs because of timing, development, estimates on staff. I think the fundamental question is, when we say this, this phase has been completed, yeah. are we going to come in at that end? Uh, how close to what we thought it was going to be? Is it yeah, I mean, historically, yeah. we are underspending our projected budget. Yeah. Um, I think there's, when you look at any particular fiscal year, there's really <laughs> three reasons that you see that we're able to stay within, even if projects go over. So one is, some projects move slower than intended. So but it means but yeah. it could mean that the cost yeah, of it, um, which is why I yeah, give you this. Yeah. That's why I give you this view, yeah. because if you take business intelligence, for example, which we'll talk about, that this we underspent based on what we projected for fiscal year 19 because that project was moving more slowly than we anticipated. The total prop cost of the project is going up because of some of the contingencies that we've triggered, which is why you get this view. But from a budget perspective, like some, some, most of those costs got shifted into state fiscal year 20, which contributed to our ability to stay in budget for fiscal year 19. So there's a couple different weight slices of the budget that it sounds like you want to see. Um, it just depends on the project. The other thing is, you know, we have we have program support staff. So we're running seven projects simultaneously. So there's a pool of staff that help us manage the big picture. We underspent on those staff by several million dollars in 19. So we had, we had projected an amount, we underspent that. That was true money that we thought we would spend that we didn't, that isn't getting pushed into 20. So there's a bunch of different reasons you have to just look at it line by line. So I want to just see if the committee is comfortable to look at it sounds like we would like a deep dive kind of multi-year financial overview in November. Uh, and can it doesn't we move have forward to be with today's anything with excruciating detail and complexity. I mean, I'm envisioning something that ought to be able to be put on a single piece of paper mm -hmm. that would show us what did we project that we were going to spend with some line items uh, associated with it vis-a-vis -vis individual projects at a given point in time when we're evaluating it, how much have we spent to date in actuality, and then a forecast, and we know that forecasts change as time goes on, how do we forecast that we're going to end in terms of what we're going to spend for integrated eligibility? And of those things that are going over, what are they? Of those things that are uh, where we're making up the savings, what are they? The, the fear that I have from an oversight perspective is that savings, uh, as, as we've described here, I can't put my, my fingers on what those where, where we're making the money up. Uh, and the, the gnawing feeling that I have is that what we may be doing is putting a, a lump of money out for what we're going to spend in project costs, support costs, overhead costs, or whatever, that is kind of a, a cushion to allow us to have tremendous variations in what we actually spend. And, and it, it, it makes me wonder how good our planning is. Okay. And my suspicion, frankly, has been fueled by what happened in Vermont Health Connect, in which by the end of the day, we wound up spending $200 million, which was by no means what we expected to do. And, yeah, I, and mean, I think that's the real all, oversight function. We have that, that information at. for you. I would like to just, I think it's important to look back at fiscal year 19, where we projected an amount and came within $100,000 of that spend. So I think that is a good indication that there is not a significant amount of cushion in our budget. You know, the budgets IE used to be carrying were about $36 million a year, and we've been significantly coming down from that, trying to get more precise. That being said, there's all sorts of stuff that we're learning every day, which changes the amount of money that we need and moves stuff from bucket to bucket, and we can provide all that information. So I'm going to ask us to 
focus on um, two things. Mm -hmm. So we we need to make a recommendation mm -hmm. um, and about the release of the next set of funds yep. and uh, any information that you need us to know uh, with your departure. Yep. Um, I think we want you to go through the your presentation. Sure. We good. You're absolutely okay. good. All right. I, Senate, just one yes. thing. Oh, I know Catherine Benham's here, yes. and obviously from Joint Fiscal, and has been involved in the capital mm -hmm. bill. Um, so, and and because it's coming to Joint Fiscal, it might be good, Catherine, if you look at the materials, yeah. to make sure that we're get, you know mm -hmm. uh, getting the, the kind of uh, information in a way that is not only um, important here, but would be for joint fiscal as well. Yeah. Um, and you're talking about the request that the Senator Brock was making? Yes. 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 Yeah. 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 As well as right. that. Because this is an issue that has been raised by joint fiscal mm -hmm. members as well in terms of, uh, and I think you uh, you had a memo that explains the the, you know, the, yes. the the ups and downs that you did for the earlier meeting. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. And we I've actually, we have that, I have that memo and all of the the projections at with a detail line on by item prepared and have already sent them to Dan Smith. So he has them as of today. The question that we need to just I need to check with finance and management about the release of those as a part of the budget. So that's the only thing I want to check on before when I leave here today. Okay, so the first uh, is just or can you go through the next sure. yep, go to the next one about what have we delivered, and this looks a lot like what we looked at last time, but it's just the recap um, that, again, we committed to delivering four products in 2019 and three in 2020. Um, as of September 16th, the last time we talked, we had to deliver two products. That was Enterprise Content Management, the Document Imaging and Scanning System, and the Paper Application. Um, we're on track to deliver the doc uploader uh, in October, November timeframe. It probably will close out midway through November. Um, and then the fourth product we'll talk about in more detail is business intelligence, which we're still, our goal is still February. And then we're on track to continue meeting our CMS mitigation requirements for the age blind and disabled population. Slide. So um, I, this I already mentioned, but there are two projects that we just started, the premium processing project, which will return qualified health plans back to the insurance carriers by October of 2020, and the online application for the age blind and disabled population to be released in June of 2020, and the economic services programs to be added to that application by the end of next year. Both of those projects are on track and the vendor kickoffs were held this week, so the vendors are on the ground and working. Um, master data management, I previewed this last time. Um, the steering committee voted this week to put that project on hold until a later date because we have too many things going on at once right now and it does not seem prudent to start another project that isn't a requirement of either the legislature or CMS until we get some of these other things, business intelligence in particular, across the finish line. Where is master data management on here? It's not on there because we haven't started it yet. Okay. So it, there's a paragraph on it in the long form report that says, hey, we're putting this on hold. It was planned in our roadmap. We had wanted to start it in October. Um, but like I said, based on the fact that we're still trying to get business intelligence across the finish line, that we're starting two big, I mean, significant public facing projects, online application and premium processing, both need to deliver real changes to the public. Um, we just don't feel it's prudent to start another project right now. So will premium processing be, um, when would that become effective? Um, October of next year we, would be. Those of us who are on the budget, remember right. a couple years ago, you, we, you assumed a million dollars in savings by having the insurers yes. do the billing. So they'll pick yeah. it up for plan year 2021. Okay. But remember, it's not like a clean break. So the insur insurance carriers will start doing the billing for plan year 2021 in November of next year. We, the state, need to continue to accept payments for 2020 plan year till about March of 2021 um, and need to be able to adjudicate 
1095 changes. Yeah. You have a three month grace period if you yeah, get advanced know, premium I tax know. credit. That's a whole so, right? <laughs> yeah, so there's there's some decommissioning that has to happen uh, in the first and probably second quarters of 2021 before we're fully out of that. that. Okay. What just oh, sure. uh, the master, what was it called? Master data, data management. Was there, a, is there a budget implication for putting that on hold? It wasn't a lot of money. It was um, the money that was in the budget was about five hundred and seventy thousand dollars gross. Um, so uh, it was to be allocated across all programs. So it saved us maybe like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars from the state budget by putting that on hold, which you know we need for business intelligence. Um, so, but it's small. Okay, so um, before we get into BI, there was uh, one particular request that came out of the, um, I think this committee and out of Dan Smith's recommendation when the last round of money was released about network connectivity and essentially how is the state going to uh, prevent projects from being impacted by network connectivity issues in the future. I'm going to turn this one over to Darren. Sure. Uh, we've uh, adopted a new uh, testing tool that will <coughs> identify whether there are issues with the network um, and with the solutions performance and it's uh, software from Apache um, and I, I think we're we've incorporated it into our development life cycle so it's going to be run as part of the routine testing cycles along with the other testing uh, we hope that'll avoid issues in the future and this had to do with the transfer of data mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That caused the significant delay. Yeah. Significant delay. Okay. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So this is functioning now. Yes. Yep. It's working. Okay. Yeah. We haven't had any uh, uh, function or replication issues uh, for for a couple months now. So it seems to be working correctly in terms of the network itself. Um, but now we have additional <laughs> testing tools we look at. Um, That's and, and <laughs> <laughs> Real yeah, he's looking right in. Fascinated by integrating. Now we have. <laughs> <laughs> he's taking my drive. It's a question about the um, Okay. I, I'm being okay. upset. Sorry. <laughs> no, no worries. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about business intelligence. So um, I put a couple of slides in here so you could see like the conversations we're having behind the scenes, uh, and because it can get sort of complicated, so just bear with me. Um, so just a recap on what the business intelligence project is. So BI, for short, is our reporting and analytics capabilities for Vermont Health Connect. And essentially, we've been using um, a standalone solution uh, called Oracle Business Intelligence, which is a part of the larger Oracle platform to run our analytics for, for Vermont Health Connect. And when I say analytics, I, you know, this, uh, it's not your typical analytics solution in that, remember that the technology for VHC is still very broken. So we've been able to do a lot and improve the customer service experience with technology that is not working even today the way we want it to. So a lot of it is manual <coughs> intervention and we really rely on our reporting system to be able to do our day-to-day -day work. So there are spreadsheets that are used to mail merge notices to people. There are spreadsheets that we use to do 1095s, to get them out the door, to do corrections. Um, it is part and parcel to our day-to-day -day functioning. Um, it's not like we're just using it to run reports on who's on our programs, it's, as you would think of a typical data warehouse or analytics solution. So it's really a part of our core business operations at this point. Um, so the idea was, hey, everyone else in the state uh, and everyone else, all the other programs in integrated eligibility are using a program called Microsoft SQL that is owned and managed and maintained by the state. And so the idea was for us to be able to sunset that standalone Oracle solution, sunset the contractor that we've been using to keep that warehouse up to date and run reports for us and move that work in-house. Um, and we've been working on that for about a year and a half, uh, talking about it for probably two and a half years now. Um, so uh, 
as you know, um, there have been, you can go to the next slide, there have been some challenges with this project. Uh, really, there's been two big challenges. Earlier this uh, spring and summer, we had network connectivity issues, which was preventing us from loading the data warehouse with production data so that we could fully test it. And this is what we just heard Correct. as part Yes. So, um, you know, you, it's very hard to know how far along you are in the project until you have real data in there and actually start testing it. And, um, you know, we really needed four months of full testing before go live. So when we knew that was happening, we triggered a contingency earlier in the summer to essentially um, delay the Oracle system upgrades that we had planned for September and push them to February to give the team more time to finish. And the reason why the Oracle upgrades are significant is because the, uh, the upgrades are upgrading everything in the VHC system. And we made the determination when we pursued the business intelligence and enterprise content management projects that those would be across the finish line for the upgrade. So we didn't need to install those pieces of Oracle software in the new Oracle package. So when you go live with the new Oracle, the new Oracle upgrades, we would not include Oracle Business Intelligence, and we would not include um, what's the the Web Center. Content. Web Center. It's for that we use for document imaging and scanning because we would have transitioned to new systems. Um, so obviously, we couldn't do make those Oracle upgrades happen if we weren't done with the <laughs> warehouse. So it got pushed to February. And so when we talked back in September, we said, all right, we have some critical milestones that the team needs to meet in order for us to feel comfortable that we're going to hit the federal, the February timeline and not trigger any further contingencies. And so that's really what we want to update you on today. Um, so this is, this is a recap of the, the contingencies that we've triggered in August. So, so here's just a recap of what the critical milestones are. So there were, I'm not, it could so in the weeds in terms of what the things actually are, but I want you to just see the big milestones we're looking at. So there was milestones for October 15th, milestones for November 30th, um, a big testing phase in December and January, then we would do the Oracle upgrades in February, and then there would be some, some phase three deliverables, like there are some reports that we could go for some period of time without if we needed to. Um, and so those could come after the Oracle upgrades. So back in September, the team basically laid this out and said, all right, each one of these phases are major contingency trigger points for us. And so um, the decisions we're making today are all about did we hit those October 15th items or not. Did you? Uh, no. So you can go to the next slide. So may I ask a question? Yes. If you go back. Another. Oh, well, um, if in fact um, business intelligence gets delayed um, beyond February, mm -hmm. then you uh, would have to install the Oracle upgrades for that. Uh, yeah, that's module, a part of what I'll go over. The which you were hoping to avoid. Correct. So you think, in fact, it's not going to be possible to avoid installing those upgrades. That's essentially the recommendation we're making, but I can walk and you through this. And there's a cost to, yes. to uh, having to do the upgrades. Yes. Okay. Oh, well, I should look ahead on my slides. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so, um, so you can see where by 10.15 we landed with the milestone. So the first criteria was there were 33 what we call priority one reports that needed to be completed in testing, tested, and by 10-15, 85% um, of them still needed need some work. So completed testing, testing's finding issues with them, the team needs to remediate some of those defects. Um, the second one was around interfaces. Um, and this, some of this gets in even in more in the weeds for me than I'm comfortable with. So, um, but but the bottom line is that there's still some integration work that <clears throat> was supposed to be finished that's not finished yet. And um, there's some uh, the data, the replication of the data into the warehouse that's happening every day. Um, it there's still some manual steps being done, and at times problems or challenges with that replication. 
um, and some changes need to be made to the code to fix that and that the best case scenario is that gets fixed by the end of October. So the short version is that there's still work to be done to hit those October 15 milestones. Um, on the WEX interface, I thought WEX was the premium processor and that we were going to move away. So I'm confused. You need to develop an interface with WEX, which is a, if, if in fact it is the premium processing yeah. vendor, which we're going to replace. Right, What's not the, until. So this why, is about so, enrollment reporting that yeah. has to go to the federal government yeah. and has to go to the insurance carriers. And uh, so, but why is that interface not already in place? I guess I'm just concerned what what needs to be developed since that So I, this is replacing the existing interface with a, the new data ware with an interface with the new data warehouse. So essentially there's integration between So there's already an interface but you have to replace it. Is right. what you're saying? Correct. All right. Thank you. So that our enrollment reports work. Yeah. So um, so basically, we, we considered three different contingencies. Um, option one was just to delay the Oracle upgrades further and give the team more time to finish the warehouse. Um, you can see these are just rough estimates of cost. Uh, the, host, the cost of hosting the, the um, existing data warehouse and the new data warehouse like in tandem, I think Darren actually said it's they negotiated down to 320000 327 a month. So a little under that $400,000 number, but still significant for every month that we delay those Oracle upgrades. Um, and then we, you know, as long as we keep the current system up and running, we need to pay Archetype, that contractor, to continue to run that. Um, so there are some costs there. Again, those are gross numbers. Uh, anytime we're talking about development, it's this is 90-10 funded. And anytime we're talking about maintenance and operations, it's 75-25. So um, the state share is anywhere from 10 to 25% of these costs. Um, option, I mean, so option two, which uh, that we talked about was um, install the Oracle software so that if we need to in the new version of the Oracle system, so that if we need to, we can keep doing business as usual for as long as we need to. Um, what we're trying to figure out now is whether this ha this also requires the delay of the Oracle upgrades by some period of time. So the question we have out for, for Optum and Archetype, our contractors, is how much time do we need to install the new software and fully test it before we can go live? Because don't forget we're in the middle of open enrollment. Um, and we need to install the new version and test all of the reports end to end before we can go live. So there is some question as to whether that can happen till February or does that have to, do the Oracle upgrades have to be delayed to March or April so that we can get the new version of the, of the software in place. Um, so there's the cost there are still TBD, but actually installing the software is $145,000. Not That's not where the <laughs> costs are. Um, but I think from a business perspective, this is certainly what what made the business most comfortable because we know how to handle what we're doing today. Um, uh, so, and then option three was. Could we go back to option two? I'm not sure, really sure I understand what it means. So, it's so what I you know we're said. Gonna, oh, we're going <coughs> to delay the upgrades, but what does it mean to install existing Oracle warehouse solution into the new environment? It's exactly what you said. So, we have Oracle so software I guess I today. I not know what I said. Yeah. So, we have Oracle software today. Oracle Business Intelligence is our reporting software. We had not intended to include it in the new Oracle upgrades. Oh. Option two is okay, include it. it. All right, I got it. So that yeah. we can All continue. Right. I understand now, but okay. the way it was written. Sorry, was I know. But so it's continue to do what we're doing today, but using upgraded Oracle software. Okay. Could, could I ask a question? Yeah. The, the, the eye popping $400,000 a month for hosting, has that been our cost historically, or is that uh, extra expensive because this is a product that Oracle doesn't really want us? Isn't that part of the issue? That it's extra because um, we're essentially paying to host two. Um, packages of software simultaneously. So as soon as we go live with the Oracle upgrades, that cost goes away. Because right now they're hosting the new 
right. Oracle yeah. system and the existing one. Uh, um, and, and it's, uh, you know, it's so frustrating to, to learn that our BI system is one that we own and control already and we have for a while, we have Microsoft SQL. Um, and, you know, but, but I understand that's the reality. But I guess I'm just, I'm just so struck by, you know, what do we have? It's more than a dollar per person per month right, mm -hmm. than we have in the, in the database. And I wonder if the analysis has been done of like what it might mean to not have to pay that for six months versus could we staff up, take that money that we would not pay and jam it into staff to get us through the cross the finish line. You know what I mean? Is yeah, I mean so basically what we're what we're um, what we're recommending is doing both of those things. So I think so the reality is that if or the risk calculation is that if we were to do option one and just staff up and delay the Oracle upgrades until May, and then we get to February and and it doesn't look like the um, warehouse is going to get done, then we're in a position to push out the Oracle upgrades until the next open enrollment, which means you're paying that $400,000 a month every month, and you're operating longer with, with software being out of support. And there's just risks there from a security perspective. So at some point, I think that's why you know the conversations have been look like we need a safeguard and we can't just keep pushing out. Like the longer you wait to make a decision, the more risk you're adding. And um, so that's why the recommendation is to install the business intelligence software so that we don't have to keep delaying the Oracle upgrades. At the same time, ADS is going to put some additional resources on the team, contracted and otherwise to try to speed up the development of the, um, of the alternative warehouse so that uh, you know, we don't have to keep doing this in perpetuity. Where are those resources coming from? Uh, we're going to take two uh, business analysts out of other projects, and then we're going to hire the three additional database administration uh, developers. Who's we? We as in? Uh, like what budget? So actually, we use ADS. We use ADS, um, and we have a chargeback model through an MOU yeah. to, to Diva. But, uh, but to your so point, Diva's budget yeah. makes that. But so to your it, point, yeah. if you can get it done faster and avoid the, yeah. the costs, which we're paying that, I mean, we're paying those costs now, um, at least on the archetype side, um, that, that really does, uh, I think, say that it's beneficial to invest more resources to get it done. And I think the so the fiscal year 20 budget right now is predicated on getting this done by February. So the fact that we decided, I think at like 4:15 yesterday, to trigger this contingency, there's some financial analysis that needs to be done to figure out how we absorb that in the IE budget for fiscal year 20. Um, again, it's 90/10. So you know, even if you end up spending a million dollars on something, it's a hundred thousand dollars in the out of the capital budget. Um, but we're running a tight ship, so um, that analysis has to be done. And when will it be done? Um, I, I would say in the, by the end of the month, uh, you know, we're waiting on information from contractors to tell us estimated costs for certain things. Will it be done before we have to make our recommendation? I would hope so, yeah. yes. Shall we first look up? No, no, it's the four business? Four business, yeah. Four, four, four business, yeah. yeah. So, like I said, the, the contingency decision was made yesterday. Yeah. I anticipate that that information will be available, certainly by that meeting. It's just we need some information from our contractors about level of effort to install the software, rebuild the reports, testing, and things like that. And who? And you said it was Lori Collins. Collins. Yes, but I think from a technical perspective, um, I would look to Darren. Um, to be able to provide information on the level of effort so of the contingencies. You've outlined three options, contingency options. Yes. So essentially, we're rec we're yeah. choosing option two, option two. plus. It's two plus. Two plus. 
So two, two plus, plus meaning staff. adding some additional staff to try to get it done faster. So is there any, okay. Is there any, are you pretty much convinced that the February date's not gonna work? based on where we are now? Based on where we are today, the consensus from the team on the ground is that we're not gonna hit February. Um, but that could change. I just think it's gonna take a while to hire people and get them up to speed and February. So, February do you have a, a new estimated timeline? No, because the, the- February to what? The, the question, well, no. So now that we're gonna add additional staff, um, the project team has to retool its project plan based on the timing of additional resources. So in terms of getting the, the database done, we'll have to see what that does to that So timeline. the project plan is going we'll to be revised. updated. Oh. And then um, the question, the outstanding question we have for Optum and Archetype is what is the level of effort and how much development has to happen to install the new version of the Oracle software because we don't I don't know how much has changed between the old version and the new version if there are not a lot of changes then you don't have to do a lot of report rewriting and it should go pretty quickly if Oracle changed some things then some of the code or the reports might need to be rewritten to get them to function appropriately in the new version of the software that's what we need Optum to tell us and that will let us know like can they get it installed by February, or is it March, or is it April, you know? Okay, so we have a couple of things that we're gonna be seeing mm -hmm. prior to meeting in November, yeah. prior to making the recommendations. Correct. Um, but I think the, you know, um, I think it's always really important to be extremely transparent with you all, obviously, about things that are difficult. Um, I think when you still look at IE as a whole, the important takeaway of that first chart is essentially seven projects in flight. There's a lot of green on that chart. So in, in considering that recommendation, I think it's just important to see the things that are going well as well as really dig into the things that are more difficult. So, so I'm just going to remind the committee also, this is, um, this is pretty important what we're dealing with. We do have ADA, our Department of Public Service sitting waiting for us as okay. well. So. I can just do a quick two minutes on finances. I think that's, yeah, sure. Okay, so that's Important. the last slide. Um, so again, the big takeaway on the financials is that while the cost of some of the individual products were higher than initially estimated, overall spending is within budget. I already mentioned um, we came in budget for 19. Um, our projections are still to remain in budget for 20. For 21, as I said, we're projecting to be over by about $218,000, but based on our historical spend, we feel like we can manage that. Um, and then uh, on the cost allocation side, I mentioned last time that we had approved and we had proposed an alternative cost allocation methodology to CMS. They have approved that cost allocation methodology, which is now accounted for in all of our budget projections. So that's really positive news. And they've approved the next two years of federal fiscal year funding for IE. Did the cost allocation actually have a uh, preserve that level of <clears throat> Medicaid contribution or did it reduce it? It reduced it, but not as much as they had originally counter proposed. So it was a good middle ground. So when you look at the, the projections of spend, overall spend, for example, in 21, it's actually lower than 20, but the state share goes is, is higher. So if Medicaid is paying <coughs> less because they say that, yep. that their share was too high, does that mean that the food stamp, the SNAP um, cost allocated portion is going to go up? Yeah, it goes up across all the other programs. It so well, it increases the state share well, of, any, of the cost of any one project, yeah. essentially. Well, I'm more concerned about like TANF and general yeah. assistance because those are all general fund. We're all tapped out on the... <clears throat> So, right, and so essentially so when you look, I mean, I... So there will be collateral impacts. Correct. Um, so for 21, for example, we had hoped to do three major projects. We can really only do two because of the cost allocation. So that's all stuff that will have to be talked about in terms of the future roadmap. What is the change in ratio that was approved? Um, it depends on the project. Okay. I don't have that off the top of my head. Okay. Um, 
And then the last one is just that, you know, we haven't successfully been able to draw down SNAP funds to support IE, so SNAP will reimburse 50-50 for any portion of functionality that benefits the SNAP program. If the state could figure out how to get those funds from FNS, it would help significantly to the tune of like a million dollars and $970,000 a year. It's just, it's very difficult, it's been very difficult to um, bring them into the fold. So can you um, tell me why uh, we should recommend the release of the second um, funds? Sure, I mean, I think that overall, when you look at how IE is doing, even today with some of the challenges, we are still delivering more technology that's benefiting Vermonters and spending less than has been done historically. And so, you know, when I think about IE and what we're trying to accomplish, it's just a, it's as much about what we're delivering as it is about how we're delivering it. And the approach is very different. And so when you look at what's green on these pieces of paper, this represents actual technology that's either making Vermonters' lives better or staff's lives better. So that's, that's one piece. Um, the other piece is there's, there's components of this roadmap that are not optional for us to do. And so when you think about the online application, for example, that's something we have to do to be in compliance with, with age blind and disabled rules for Medicaid. And at some point there will be costs of non-compliance. And so I think the challenge with technology in general is for government is that it's, it isn't optional. The question is, are, is the strategy we're using uh, uh, doing a good enough job at delivering value and reducing risk for the state. Um, and I think when you look overall at what we're able to do, the fact that we're able to deliver this technology and stay within budget is, is a significant improvement on where we were two years ago or four years ago or six years ago. Will be the consequence of the Joint Fiscal Committee not giving you those dollars? Um, I mean, the project would, would essentially stop, and there's a risk that CMS would start to levy financial penalties against the state of Vermont for noncompliance. Thank you. Just quickly, is it fair to say that the challenges we face now all stem back to the challenges that we talked about in the summer when we, you know, the, the, it's basically this, this database challenge, right? It's just showing mm -hmm. up in, in an ongoing tension that is adding costs and, and requiring uh, contingencies. Is that a fair assessment? You mean the delay? Yeah, I mean, I mean, we're looking, it's not like this is a new new issue that's cropped up or a new, so right. as we try Just to figure out, of yeah, that's authority. right, the same thing that we've <laughs> yeah. um, Yes, I think that's fair. I think, I think the thing is, you're never going to get the uncertainty out of an IT project, and um, untangling from a system that it was a monolith that uses Oracle software that is really troubled is going to be difficult and their unanticipated things will happen. And so, but the value of breaking the projects into smaller pieces and parts is that when there's a project with a problem with one project, it doesn't tank all of the projects. So if this were three years ago and we were having a problem with the data warehouse, everything would stop. In this scenario, you have six projects that are able to continue and do, you know, deliver value while you manage a problem with one single piece of a system. And so the problem that we're having today is the same problem that we've been having since the summer on one project, but it hasn't, it hasn't impacted the other projects, which is, it's, it's really about managing risk effectively. It's not about saying everything is going to go perfect all the time. That's just not reality, especially given that we have a system that we're untangling from that we don't really understand. So, uh, so just, um, will we be getting another memo assessment of yes, progress Dan from Dan be, Smith? Dan is going to write another memo after he gets the report. Okay. okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you uh, very for much. all your work. Sure. Yeah. Best of wishes. Thank you very much. Um, let's make sure, Mike, that we can actually pass on to speakers on the various items that we want to. I'm leaving. So you really have a safe and We have uh, three items that I think we had asked for an update on. Um, coverage go, uh, implementation of Act 79, uh, and the readiness to complete the 2020 um, 
telecom plan. And so uh, we're going to hear about that uh, from you all. Uh, we'd originally scheduled you for an hour. We do need to spend some time with um, Becky Wasserman. Uh, so we will give you as much time as you need. But um. well, thank you very much for having us. I actually don't think we'll need that much time. We'll try to be as concise and um, and uh, quick as possible. Uh, so thank you very much for having us. Um, we're happy to be here. Uh, it's been a while since we've come to Jai Talk and spoken to you. So um, back in this time last year. Um, so I want to talk about the three items that uh, you asked us to report on. Um, the first being Act 79 implementation. Uh, we were very happy with many of the aspects of Act 79. Uh, it's, a, it's been a great bill, I think, for, um, for many reasons. Uh, the first being um, the, uh, the emphasis back on broadband um, and telecom. Uh, there's, there's been a lot of discussion leading up to the um, last legislative session that I think drove um, many of the items, uh, programs created by Act 79. Um, the first item is the Broadband Innovation Grant. Um, we have started that process. We've issued um, a solicitation for grant applications, and we are expecting grant applications in, uh, for the first round um, in our office next week. We've had a lot of interest. Um, nearly a dozen entities, I think, have um, expressed intent to bid, either in this round or a subsequent round. So um, there is a lot of interest out there, and we're looking forward to um, getting some of those projects off the ground. Um, we anticipate issuing three rounds. As you recall, it's $705,000 uh, in grant funding for broadband innovation grants. This first round that we issued um, at the beginning of September. Could I just yeah. go back, Clay? Um, sure. You used the term grants, and then it used the term vendors. And my, uh, oh, okay. I, I'm sorry. I'm. Yeah, my apologies. Uh, no, there would not be vendors there. Um, and so, uh, okay. Yeah. I just want to post like <laughs> I, I don't usually yeah. consider it. You know, not at all. Oh, no. Okay. The thank vendors you. who typically seek grants in this yeah. room are the yeah. correct. Yeah. Right. The, thank these you. These are mostly uh, municipalities. Right. Uh, and uh, like what we had at the Lindenville meeting, the possibility. I don't know if that ever moved forward, but mm -hmm. uh, that, mm -hmm. right. that's, same thing. Right. That's what we're talking about. But when you use the mm -hmm. term vendor, it kind of. Mm -hmm. Confused my simple. My, my apologies, that was um, a mischaracterization, so I did not attempt to use that term. Um, they're mostly community groups uh, mm -hmm. and uh, municipalities, mm -hmm. uh, communication union districts. Um, we wanted to do three grant rounds. We wanted to get one off the ground right away because we knew that there were entities out there that were waiting uh, for this opportunity and were ready to apply. We anticipate giving out three grants uh, this fall. Uh, the legislation allows us to award um, up to two grants to distribution utilities. These are electric utilities. Um, after we complete um, our electric utility feasibility study, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, so in February, after we're done with that study, we anticipate issuing a second round that will be for distribution utilities interested in studying um, a, a broadband project within their uh, DU territory. And then the third round, we are waiting until April with anticipation that at town meeting day in March, uh, many communities will debate and possibly form uh, communication union districts. It's the law that allows towns to band together to build broadband. And so we certainly want to encourage communication union districts and want to give out the bulk of the money after towns have had time to form, have their first meeting, and um, be ready to, to apply. So. Okay. Um, in addition, uh, and uh, in anticipation of, um, uh, of receiving grant applications, we've also um, uh, met with many communities, Wyndham County being one, uh, quite a few counties, or two counties in Franklin County, um, 
uh, several in Lamoille. So we have a meeting in Hyde Park coming up. Um, towns all over are interested. So we're trying to uh, meet with towns in person if that's what they want um, and talk about um, how they can uh, uh, take advantage of this program and our other broadband programs. The next item um, that um, we're well on our way to completing is the broadband uh, utility study. This is a study of whether electric DUs should be in the broadband business, how, how they could uh, get into the broadband business. We've hired a consultant, so there was a budget associated with that. I think it's $50,000. We've hired a consultant, Magellan. Um, they've done a lot of work in Vermont. Uh, they're well aware of um, Vermont law, uh, Vermont's energy policies, our broadband policies. Um, they've done a lot of work with Velco um, and their fiber and, and how the Velco could leverage their fiber. So they're well placed to write this report. If we could also introduce Scott yes. Wheeler from mm -hmm. our electric uh, finance division. This is a um, real manifestation of how we've integrated the thinking at the department in telecom and the electric utility regulatory space because uh, the study correctly addresses um, a phenomenon that is slowly gaining traction in the country of convergence where the uh, work of the electric space is converging with the work of the telecom space and people are increasingly recognizing that renewable energy and the transformation of the energy landscape very much depends on having robust broadband. So this is a promising development, and Scott here is working, he's, he's directing the, um, the feasibility study that we're doing that Clay was talking about. We also, I should note, um, in hiring Magellan, had to spend a little more money than the legislature appropriate for this because their bid came in higher than the authorized amount. So that part, the department's picking up out of its uh, breast receipts funds. For the record. Yes, ma'am. You asked for a name. Yeah. Oh, okay, by all means, I'm sorry. June Tierney, I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Public Service. And this is Clay <laughs> Purvis, the Telecommunications Director. I thought I introduced myself. I'm not sure. Sure. I, mean, I was going to introduce our crew, but okay. I'm, saying I right into it. Okay. <laughs> yes, I'm trying to uh, take what you said, Commissioner. Um, for example, um, so much of energy um, policy is going to actually take smart meters and yes. internet connection, yes. uh, like you know, you're charging of your EVs. To, mm -hmm. So that's really what you're... That's what convergence uh, is That's about. the convergence that you're right. referencing. Right. Okay. There were two uh, National Governors Association studies done uh, in the summer of 2018. They had front pages on both studies, pictures on them. One of them was about transportation, and the other was about uh, renewable energy deployment. Both of them had symbols on them that dealt with broadband and telephones and uh, smartphones. And they had substantial chapters in both uh, reports as well about broadband. And that's where you can really see convergence happening. So you, you've hit it right on the nail. Uh, so as a part of that, we are, um, uh, we've issued surveys to every DU, well, 17 of them, a lengthy survey, collecting information. We're meeting with every DU. We're meeting with several telecom carriers uh, in the next couple of months to talk about this study. So. I think we're well placed to um, complete that study, and I think it'll have. Um, I think it'll take us in a good direction. And who will be receiving that study? When it's completed? It is a legislative report, so the legislature will um, will receive that study. I believe on January first. You mean which committees? Which committees? Uh, House Energy, uh, Senate Finance, Scott. Um, I think there's uh, Natural Resources. You may have stumped me. That's okay. Okay, That's I, there's at least those three, but there may be okay. there may be others, and I'll certainly we'll please. share with sure. anyone who's interested in uh, receiving that. Speech. We should also note in the study that we're reaching out to the PEC, so that it's not just yeah. the policy folks on the ground who are working on this, but the folks who make regulatory decisions as well, in order to spread the knowledge about the report. Yeah, the PUC's been doing a lot on the transportation mm -hmm. sector. Mm -hmm. Last year we were, mm -hmm. that was full time mm -hmm. focus. It's all good and necessary work. Mm -hmm. The Vita Loan Program is underway. It's received its first application, so that's available. And uh, taking loan applications, we're working closely with Vita. Um, 
where um, our duties and theirs intersect, which is to advise them on um, uh, which locations within the application are eligible under our program, which have broadband, which do not. Um, so that's uh, that seems to be going well as well. Um, there are numerous other items uh, within Act 79. Battery backup, um, we've had three workshops. We have another workshop on Monday um, on the battery backup issue. Uh, the PUC is in charge of, or um, responsible for writing that final report. We've been participating well. I think that's, I think that's going well, and I think the report will reflect some good ideas. Um, the PEG study is another one. Um, coverage code telecom plan is certainly part of Act 79, and I'll talk about that next. Uh, no. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah. we, we, we also had a significant um, part of that bill was bringing in additional uh, human resource to. Yes, thank you very much. I forgot yeah. to mention we have that resource starting. I hate to refer to a human being as a resource, but um, uh, that employee is starting November 4th, and he will be um, taking the lead on all of the community outreach mm -hmm. associated to big, with BIG and. Um, Connectivity initiative and um, advising on uh, towns on all matters of, of broadband. So. Okay, broadband, fantastic. He's got, um, as I mentioned before, he's got a, a full plate ahead of him already. We have half a dozen meetings, I think, between now and the end of the year. So he's coming to Bennington County. He'll come to Bennington. Yeah, anything after November fourth, he'll be there for us. So. I think we should add too. We were lucky to steal him from Paul Costello and the rural council that they they do work and he's done prior community yeah. outreach in Vermont, so he's very well versed in Vermont, and I see that as a huge strength for this hire. Fantastic. Okay. Anything else on Act 79 implementation that you want to update us on? I think those are the big items. Okay. Um, Does if you have any other have questions. Questions on Act 79 implementation at this point? Um, I guess I'm, I'm trying to remember the other big piece was the uh, grants to build out and, and uh, will you just remind me was that in another phase after sort of the small uh, planning grants or, or there it, there uh, was increased funding for the connectivity initiative that's something that continues so we, we okay. I, I'm thinking more of the the, the loans up to Four million or whatever that was. Was that through the connectivity? No, that was through Vita. Vita. So that that's that has been established. Vita, Vita and uh, we worked with Vita. They they've established their program. They've received their first loan application uh, for a project in uh, Lamoille and Franklin. So okay. it's exciting. Um, you know, mm. this just points out how we are making. Uh, um, you know, we all are concerned about economic development, and our, um, our legislative economist said, if there's one thing that we can do for the rural economy, it's broadband. Um, and, um, and oftentimes what we look at, like in commerce, is the budget for ACCD without really looking at, in the aggregate, what, where investments are being made um, in a more comprehensive way. There, years ago was a report, and um, like all reports, it became about that thick and it died of its own weight and didn't have very much utility. But I think we constantly need to say, you know, how we're supporting the economic development of this state, um, whether it's through uh, this kind of initiative to uh, workforce or whatever we might be funding. And, and we see it in, to some extent in, um, in appropriations, but I, I just think that um, oftentimes people don't connect yes. what might happen in one bill and mm -hmm. sort of the, the way that it complements or uh, augments what mm -hmm. um, um, is happening in other parts of state government. So I just wanted to say I view this as this, you know, this progress is really so much a part of what is key to the economic um, development of the state. Senator, I could not agree with you more. Um, I also think when we talk about this issue with economic development, it is important to not let it be defined 
strictly by economic development. I think our communities won't grow if they don't have this, but we've moved into a place where this is also critical for access to public safety, Absolutely. access to government, access to education opportunities, health care. So um, all of those things. I think John Muir said connect. everything is connected to yes. everything else. And that's, you know, <laughs> there we go. So uh, there we go. Uh, it's just a matter of seeing um, all those connecting points. Yeah, I see it both ways, actually. It's economic development, mm -hmm. and it's also economic preservation. And then it's also, it's, this is what convergence is about. Mm -hmm. You can have a strong heart, you can have a strong brain, but you don't have anything if you don't have a strong <coughs> circulatory system in a body, and that's what broadband to me is all about. That's an interesting analogy. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> <laughs> the nerves, right? Oh. All right. Mm. Okay, so if we have no other questions on Act 79, do you have a question? Sir? I do not. No. Okay. Okay. So I have a, uh, I'm trying to link back. We had, and Randy helped me on, on this, we actually had an amendment on the floor that the, there's equipment that had been purchased. Coverage co-equipment. The coverage co-equipment. Mm -hmm. And um, Senator Hooker ha was the sponsor of the amendment that basically said make that equipment available even though yes. it's kind of there's some obsolete aspects to it. At least it was something when you had nothing. What? And to so make it available to municipalities. Yes, mm -hmm. and right to make it available. So is this what you're going to talk? That's exactly what we're Because I, I, I have, you know, my memory is like a junkyard, and so <laughs> I just been like, is that? Is that what we're talking about? Except your memory's not like a junk yet. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 My memory has much more of this junk. Um, <laughs> uh, um, yes, and with regard to Coverage Co, we had action in place prior to the passage of Act 79. So I think I'm, I'm hopeful that we're going to hear. Let's start at the beginning. Thanks. Okay. Or, or at least start. I can start all the way at the beginning. I can go back to 2012, or I can start after they go out of business. Um, uh, plans, but two sentences. Two sentences. All right. Yeah. Uh, the VTA, which used to exist, um, invested uh, in this project of putting up well, micro cells. These are very small cellular units um, that would go on telephone poles. Um, they. Uh, partnered with a company called Coverage Co. Uh, Coverage Co is a subsidiary of the manufacturer of the equipment, um, so you can you can see uh, the benefit to uh, the manufacturer there. Um, and uh, it cost about five million dollars in total. Um, these went up on telephone poles. They completed about half, well, about a third of the um, the total project, and then went out of business. The reason they went out of business was because they had agreements with the large carriers to carry their traffic for them. So if you had a cell phone, you were out in Stockbridge, um, and you had a Verizon cell phone, you could connect to one of these uh, units, um, and Verizon would pay coverage code four cents a minute to carry your call. Uh, what they found out was in places like Stockbridge, um, there isn't enough cell traffic out there <coughs> to cover the cost of maintaining these units. Mm -hmm. and which were largely deployed on roadways. Which were largely and deployed. not centers. Correct. So if you were driving down the road at 60 miles an hour making a cell phone call, you would connect to one of these boxes for a minute at the most. And the idea was that there would be handoff and that they would be like daisy chain down the road and you would be able to carry a call um, as you go down the road and some of these sites made a whopping five to ten dollars a month they had costs of about three hundred dollars a month um, so they were quickly upside down they went out of business um, wasn't there a shift in there or some 911 fees or something that also played into that well, they're, um, every cell carrier is required to uh, follow FCC rules called the, the Phase Two rules, which uh, require the carrier who's carrying the call to transmit to 911 um, database information of your exact location. 
and there are rules with, I think it's within 50 meters or 25 meters, I can't remember, of your actual location so that the police know exactly where you are and can find you if you're unable to state your location. Um, every carrier complies with that. Coverage Co. had to comply with that as well. Uh, it does cost a significant amount of money, so the, um, the, the largest fee, I think, that Coverage Co. had to cover was um, a, a cost for this service, which is handled by a third party. Um, there's a couple companies in, in the United States that handle this service, one of them being in Trotto. Trotto is a new name, I don't remember what it is. But it's a yeah. In Trotto, it's a 911 out of Colorado vendor, isn't it? That's right, yes. And they, um, they provide a multitude of 911 services. One is this database service. Um, so that's an expense. The average site costs about 300, uh, well, uh, between 150 and 300, depending on the site. Um, so um, I'm the, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Wasn't there a change in some of that dynamic? I, I, I thought coverage there was some went out. Change. 911 coverage went out too. Wasn't no, what happened was Randy, you at the time that Coverage Co. did their financial projections, the geolocation piece was they had planned to have all of the carriers, uh, uh, the major carriers involved, uh, connect with them. Uh, and all of them did, except AT&T declined to do so, and it was a substantial amount of calls that came through AT&T that were unreimbursed. So and all cell carriers are required to carry all 911 traffic, that they're capable regardless of right. whether it's their right. customer. But not non-911 non -non travel and, uh, connection, and that's Correct. where, that's where yeah. the cost breakdown came through, by not so having AT&T as uh, available uh, you know, to appropriated a hundred thousand dollars you asked for that to, was that was later in the hundred thousand yeah. dollars was to provide a resource for the public service department to be able to provide support to municipalities that wanted to so, um, so to get you, these coverage code boxes I, I think and we're going to get, get there now, yeah, okay. so chronologically so let's, after they went out of business um, we were uh, reappropriated the remainder of the VTA capital um, budget for uh, this project. We issued an RFP to find a new network operator. Uh, we received two bids. Um, we weren't um, uh, completely satisfied with those bids. There's still a possibility. They're still hanging out there. But we have not uh, made a definitive decision on those bids. Um, but in response to those bids, we decided to change tact and figure out, yeah. I mean, I'm just gonna stop you for a second. Yeah. So a new network operator would have just operated what was up, would have had to figure out the costs of connection and... Not and necessarily. We, we made our RFP broad enough yeah. that if an operator came in and said, I can do this cell coverage a different way better, then we would have accepted that. And did anybody come in and say, I could do this in a different we, way better? Right. We received two bids. One uh, was more in line with the coverage co model of deploying small, small cells. Uh, the, the second uh, bidder was going to uh, deploy macro sites, what we call big sites, um, through uh, the use of blimps, so float blimps, and uh, with equipment inside. Um, uh, that's something that is being tested in other parts of the country, but it's not been commercially deployed yet. <coughs> Although, as I so, recall, that project is underway. Still. It is underway, yeah. <coughs> it's it's uh, battle-tested technology that the military has used, and successfully so. But the question is whether we would be willing to accept large aerostat balloons. <laughs> it it sounds funny, but it works. Mm -hmm. Sounds so great yesterday. <laughs> That's kind of the point. You, know, you yeah, yeah. reel them back in and you put them back up immediately as opposed to having the system down because it's blown down. So mm -hmm. there's a resiliency factor there. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, after the results of that RFP, we decided to change tact and to help uh, sustain the coverage co model of, of having an operator support the operations of these microcells. Um, survey towns to see if they'd be willing to um, support some of the cost of the microcells in their communities. 
Um, we uh, surveyed all towns uh, with the help of the League of Cities and Towns and Regional Planning Commissions. Um, we found that 35 towns would be willing to provide some sort of financial support, the average being for two sites in their town um, at an average cost of $900 per site per year. Um, the total cost of a site can range between $1,400 and $1,800 a year. So that's, that really does change the dynamics. So with that in hand, we've issued a new RFP. Uh, results are due back next week. Um, that would um, would uh, obligate a, an operator to use the capital appropriation to put up um, a restore coverage co uh, equipment. Um, the towns would pay. Uh, yep. Require them to use the or their own if if they can do it better. But there's there's no obligation that they have to use their own. And the reason for that is because there may not be a fiber connection where many of these are deployed. So if, if it is going to rely on a DSL connection, um, this may be the right technology for now. I'm not going to go down that bunny hole. Okay. okay. It, it is quite a hole, too. Um, Could I ask a question? So 35 towns said they'd pony up some money. That'll mm -hmm. change. Does that mean that if, in fact, you get a vendor and you have the installation, then the towns that didn't pony up, in, is, will they, in fact, have the benefit? In other words, are they freeloader towns and... Uh, no. Uh, uh, and, uh, no, you'd have to pay to have this. Uh, yes. No, but I, I didn't know if, in fact, it, it would... There would having be no that site would provide yeah. benefits yeah. beyond yeah. the geographic they're limits pretty, of the town. They're, they're, they're pretty, small. yeah, they're, they can go about a quarter of a mile oh, okay. in either direction. Right. Um, they are pretty small. There may be that, you know, on a border, if, okay. you know, no, but... I, I was just, thank you. I, I, I don't think there'd be any cross-subsidization in that. Um, we, the towns would be would supporting sites and other... often comes up in terms of who pays and who gets. Correct me if I'm wrong, but... Uh, this would likely be most ideally used in rural village centers that have no cell service. Correct. Mm -hmm. And that's not how they were originally deployed. They were originally deployed largely on rural roadways. Yes, that is correct. So. With the idea that you would have continuous, uninterrupted right. cell coverage yeah. between village A and village B. I see. Um, and the, the spots between the villages would be supported by sites that were making more than their costs in um, uh, more urban areas. I imagine that with this setup, that there's going to be a natural, um, of course, since the towns are paying for it, they can choose where they want to put them. So if they have a specific public safety concern, there's this one bend on the on such and such road where people are always going off. Maybe we should put one there, yeah. and they can support that. But I, I imagine uh, with the towns choosing where they want to put it, they're going to tend toward okay. village areas where people are more likely to use them. Or, or yeah. maybe gaps, right? I mean, if they, or gaps, everyone yes. drops a call at one particular spot, I would assume. Yes, correct. I think I think this this whole issue of the coverage co being in this bill was just a function of the fact that, A, we had the stuff, uh, and uh, it was clear that there wasn't a vendor that was going to replicate what Coverage Co. had done, and the choice was to find some use for this that would be practical on the one hand, or get these for sale before they become even more obsolete than they are. And I think the one thing that struck many of us was the fact that in the last year that Coverage Co. was up, there were 1,200 E911 calls that were made through these boxes. So that in itself suggested that there was value in having them. Now, the fact, though, that with, with what we're doing, putting them in village centers as opposed to uh, along highways suggests that the use has changed and we still may not have solved that E911 problem. Uh, mm -hmm. And that goes to the larger question of, of the need, and that is to figure out a way to get cell phone coverage yes. throughout Vermont, which we still I, haven't quite done yet. And I can't disagree with you, Senator. I, I would only say in response that um, with towns 
if the towns are funding this, they should have some decisional control as to where they go. Um, but in addition, we've reached out to public safety who believes that there may be a use for these boxes, to the extent we might have surplus um, equipment uh, for their two-way uh, radio systems. Mm -hmm. So they could do a coverage co-like, well, not coverage co, but a microcell-like mm -hmm. project with two-way radios um, using uh, cover, uh, sites that Coverage Co. had established um, but aren't being used currently. And then the, the third um, avenue we're exploring is state parks, many of which do not have yeah. cell phone service. We had a, a, a great success actually at Barnard at Silver Lake. Um, that was probably the, the hottest site as far as traffic goes. And um, replicating that at other state parks like Maidstone or um, all over. I mean, most state parks mm -hmm. have, a, have a cell issue, so um, there, there's a there's an opportunity there as well. So. Yes. Sorry, but I go to state park at least once a year camp, and not having cell service is okay. Um, <laughs> I'm just curious <laughs> if, if if we yeah. have a, <laughs> any consumer data on whether or not it really is wanted <laughs> in state park. I, it's just a uh, the the only data point we have is that the, the Barnard site was the, the probably it was used hottest. A lot. Yeah, and I don't know if that was by park goers necessarily or people in the village on the other side of the lake. Um, but you know, yeah, again, right. going back to public safety, yeah. um, maybe that rowdy camp party gets out of control. I don't know. There's, I, you don't, certainly don't have to use your cell phone. Um, but there may be. Uh, you can leave it at home. Yeah, you can leave it at home. <laughs> then you don't know. Um, so the, the, the third component is the one hundred thousand dollars. I'm sorry. The third component of Coverage Co. is the one hundred thousand um, dollars that uh, we can deploy to help towns. We've issued um, another RFP for a consultant that we would make available to towns. Um, if we do not get results that we like from that, we'll just move to a grant system where we provide a grant directly to towns um, so they can hire a consultant of their choice. But uh, we thought it would be uh, helpful to towns to have um, a person that they can reach out to immediately. So once we have that on board, we'll, um, we'll provide notice to the towns with the help of the regional planning commissions. And refresh my memory, what will that consultant be helping the towns with? Uh, that consultant would be assisting the towns with uh, ways that they could use this equipment to either create their own system um, or um, decide where, if we have a network operator in place, decide where they should be putting systems um, to get the, uh, the most benefit from them. Okay. And I see we have Becky Rachel. So last issue is readiness to complete. I, I'm sorry. Are you done? With I, coverage I, I'm done. Yes. Okay. Uh, readiness to complete the uh, 2020 telecom plan. So we're currently assessing our readiness to complete the plan. I think we're in a much better position today to have that plan delivered by December 1 of, um, of 2020. Yeah. Um, so the legislation has changed the requirements of what should be in the telecom plan, um, which would, uh, at the very least, necessitate a comprehensive overhaul of what we already have, essentially a new plan. Um, the legislation also changed the way public comments are handled, as well as uh, sets um, a finite number of hearings. So the plan is due December 1, working back from there, it's a, it's a pretty aggressive schedule. Um, we would have to conduct the hearings um, in October and uh, November, so having a final draft before then um, and a public comments draft probably at least two months before that. So that gives us the winter and um, half the summer to um, issue the public comments draft of the plan. We had, I believe in the legislation, you were uh, asked to come to the legislature by a date certain uh, to advise us if for any reason you did not feel that you would be able to comply with producing the plan 
uh, in, on time. And, and I, I think one of the purposes we had for including it this, uh, with, in, in this agenda today is to just get a sense from you whether you felt uh, that you were comfortable in being able to produce it without having to come back to us for, for, for anything additional next year. Is that how you feel right now? Well, we're certainly assessing our ability. One thing we're doing is uh, uh, we've issued um, a request for information to see if an outside consultant should write this plan. Um, so gauge what the cost is, what that would look like, um, whether that's an avenue to explore. So I would say we're exploring our, um, uh, our, our different uh, options for meeting that deadline. The legislation, I believe, asks us to um, come to the legislature with sufficient time for the legislature to act, um, yes. which would necessarily be this session. Uh, particularly yeah. on, on financial resources, sure. is my memory. And the RFI is intended to give us a price tag for what it would take to have an outside consultant um, prepare the plan, because it is a, a resource issue. But our thinking today is very much intent on how do we succeed with this mission. And so if it comes back that this is an affordable um, thing to do, to have somebody um, come back, come and do the plan, that would be great. Uh, I may be writing to you then to ask for the money for that, because as others are aware on the committee, the department has been under severe financial pressure, and this is an unfunded mandate. We are also trying to aim for success without that, and that was the schedule that Clay gave us, uh, to be perfectly candid. There are many things competing for the department's attention, particularly the telecom divisions, and so that's a, a careful juggling thing. But certainly uh, meeting the assigned deadline is the intent of the department, however we can get there. So with all these pressures, uh, and this, this it seems like it's such a um, critical area, but the body of expertise to put together a plan like this, my question is, would it actually be to the state's benefit to have that external horsepower, so to speak, in the plan development, or that versus just well, an in-house yes. um, The way I project. tried to approach that, Senator, is this, the product that we delivered last time around was a product of our in-house resources. Um, I have received the message that it was not satisfactory to the legislature, and so our thinking was then we need to go to a new approach, which would be to see what an external resource might tell us we should be doing or proposed by way of plan, coupled with the new requirements in the statute. Okay. So that's that's our thinking. We're, we want to get a plan done that is acceptable to the legislature and that is useful to um, the folks who would turn to this plan for their guidance in doing any number of activities in the state. Um, I will say that uh, I'm proud of the work we've done, but I understand that others see it differently. Okay. Great. 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 okay, do we have any other questions? Great. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hello. So the remaining time that we have, uh, wanted to pick up on the conversation that we started um, at the last meeting. Um, items, recommendations that would be coming out of this committee, potential recommendations for legislation, potential um, proposed legislation. Um, and so Becky, maybe the thing to start with mm -hmm. for the committee um, are just going over, um, making sure we're all clear um, what we have so far identified as issues we want to focus on. Sure, and I have this yeah. list the handout if that's yes. helpful. Yep. This is very high level. It's um, so Becky Wasserman, Legislative Council. Um, so I'm handing out a, a draft memo of list of recommendations for next session. 
Um, and this list was taken from the end of the last meeting um, when the committee was putting together some ideas. So it's, it's just a very rough draft at this point. Um, so I'll just go through the list and um, I think there might be some questions on what was meant by certain items that maybe we can get clarification on. Um, so the first one was create workforce development initiatives in the information technology profession. Why don't we go through all of these and okay. then come back. Okay. Okay, so um, refer an evaluation to the Judiciary Committee's um, to look at both federal and state statutory provisions relating to cy cyber crimes and the idea there I think was to look at whether there were any deficiencies in the in both federal or state law that needed to be uh, addressed. And this is something Representative Chief said um, Developing a, a risk assessment process within the Agency of Digital Services. Um, then there was discussion of um, having some legislation um, relating to various uh, reporting requirements. Um, the first that was mentioned was the level three, four, and five risks um, and how to let the legislature know about those. Um, a system for notifying the legislature and the judiciary um, for when ADS or the executive branch is doing audits and system testing. And then the last one relates to any state data backup requirements. Um, the next one on the list deals with uh, local government cybersecurity risks. So I think you heard more about that today. Uh, this, the next is um, evaluating progress and compatibility between existing and proposed technologies. Um, so I think that one might need some clarification. Uh, cre uh, next is creating some sort of interbranch council to oversee cooperation on cybersecurity issues. Um, then I think Kevin discussed this earlier is assessing the vulnerability of legislators and conducting legislator training on cybersecurity. Um, the next one, number nine, is looking at, um, I think there's a typo there, whether there's a need for a legislative expert on cybersecurity who can provide technical assistance to the legislature, um, and this would be a similar role to what Dan Smith plays right now, um, except on a, a different topic. And the last one uh, is looking at um, system vulnerabilities and what actions can be taken to address them. I think this is state system. Okay, so shall we start from the top? I want to start from the top, and um, I think what I'd like to do is to see, you know, first if there's consensus that yes, we want to make a recommendation in this general area, and then start um, putting a little um, flesh on that bone for Becky. So um, many of these would tie back to. Um, the policy committees. Mm -hmm. So what we would be doing is recommending that as part of their committee work in the ensuing year, they mm -hmm. look at these areas mm -hmm. um, for further examination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Okay. So with regard to workforce and development initiatives um, in the uh, IT profession, so uh, Senator Brock has uh, asked if there's um, I'm not even sure what the what the I think both of you had talked about the ability to raise the pay. If that's a recommendation that we want to make, if we want to make a recommendation, they do that market assessment. factor adjustment. Market factor, market factor adjustment. adjustment. Yeah, through uh, through human resources, and mm -hmm. I know we had uh, uh, Beth digging in on that, and I think she indicated that she was looking at that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have the capacity to do yeah, that. Yeah, that and, and so there's no change in law that would be required for them to do that. I think what we can do is, is, is just indicate in our report that we do see that there are, are, are perhaps deficiencies in the amount that we pay uh, folks uh, in certain IT functions and to request that the uh, Commissioner of Human Resources look at, at the appropriate use of market factor adjustments based on if their evaluation support it in these areas. I, I think in addition to that, but we were thinking of, or at least I was thinking more in terms of promotion of information technology as a profession, as an industry, in terms of uh, 
high school, community college, college curriculum, apprenticeships, uh, career pathway, that sort of thing. Um, I mean, we certainly put a lot of money into workforce training uh, and to put additional, uh, among the amount of money we have, maybe put some additional emphasis on information technology in terms of a, a preferred, a suggested area for students to look at. So not just salary uh, information, but just promotion How you of recruit. recruiting and, and encouraging young people to go into that. Well, I know certainly in some of our economic development programs, as we're looking at everything from internships to mm -hmm. uh, supporting uh, education, right. there are particular professions that either done or occupations that represent need that we've talked about in legislation, such as right. nursing and right. healthcare professions, uh, construction, mm -hmm. and so on, mm -hmm. is to ensure that information uh, technology and it's information part. security mm -hmm. are in, included in that and, and just a referral to the uh, appropriate committees on economic development to consider that. Right. So this would right. be economic development. Yes. Um, would it also be education or no? Just well, um, actually in the economic development bill mm -hmm. for a couple mm -hmm. of years ago, mm -hmm. they, we put a position into the Department of Education for the tech, because so much of it was really mm -hmm. related to the tech center. Well, and that he left. Mm -hmm. uh, but the position is, I don't know, I can't, read, I'm not sure what's happening in the Department of Ed or mm -hmm. Agency of Ed mm -hmm. at this point. But I, I think um, we could, um, it, it, it was very much a part of an economic development bill in terms of the workforce piece. So I think um, we should that would be a recommendation mm -hmm. back uh, to the the other thing that comes up is that under the federal programs you've got this workforce investment board it's got you know I mean the board's so big you need an auditorium to house it it's over mm -hmm. 60 people I think but to me this is the kind of, of um, discussion that that group should be having because it brings in the educators it brings in the employers and so forth so maybe we could um, uh, tie this into some kind of recommendation to economic development and um, how they could identify um, those structures that are there that can help evaluate and put together some kind of plan. So this is commerce. Commerce. This is commerce. Yeah. Um, however, uh, with the uh, Beth Prestige, mm -hmm. so making that recommendation is that that's is that a legislative? That's not a legislative. No. Uh, well. Is it GovOps? GovOps. GovOps. Yeah. It would be GovOps because okay. it's state employees. Okay. Mm -hmm. GovOps. GovOps. Okay. Uh, Becky, do you have questions? Do you have a sense of what the committee is looking for there? Yeah, okay. I do. And back to the workforce thing for just a minute. The, the, uh, are we just sort of encouraging commerce or economic development to to ask these questions and poke around? And I, I mean, I, I guess I'm not clear what we're I think what we're doing Same. perhaps is just emphasizing uh, to them our, our perspective that there represents a need uh, for additional resources uh, in, uh, in information technology and information security in particular uh, as part of uh, uh, a critical need in our workforce and encouraging them to perhaps explore this further, and I don't think we, okay. can, we should That's go further okay. than that. So, and I think the frame here is really state, I mean, it's our state systems. So we're having a hard time keeping our high-level state security, right? Well, I think this is larger than just the state. Yeah. I think this is a statewide problem, and I think mm -hmm. it affects both right. the private sector private. as well as the private government sector sure. in terms of a, a critical uh, employment need. In terms of the state need, that's where the fee, the, the, the salary structure mm -hmm. is acute. Yeah. Okay, that's, I, I just wanted to understand that. But there's a, just a critical need for people with that skill set throughout the bond. And yeah. from an economic development standpoint, some of our emphasis in, uh, in, in what we do with the recruitment, training, <coughs> workforce development, uh, we, we recommend that more emphasis be placed in this area. Good. Mm -hmm. Next. Okay. Um, Seth, this is this was, uh, and you were joining us uh, over the phone, so I'm not sure that we got this correct, but uh, this evaluation to the Judiciary Committees to review 
uh, federal and state statutory provisions on cyber crimes to determine if there are any deficiencies. I'd like to just check if I understood what you were talking about. So, I mean, I think what you were saying was, does it translate to, um, you know, theft as a cyber crime versus I walk in your front door and steal something? Do we need to modernize our statutes? Is that what you're saying to yeah. reflect um, um, cyber crimes and that maybe, um, that well, sometimes our statutes are outdated for today's environment, and mm -hmm. uh, do they adequately address um, um, the growing rate of cyber uh, crimes? Right, um, and, and you know, it, it, the the location of a crime oh across uh, states you're talking yeah. about jurisdictional issues right yeah. um, as well as um, you know it, it weighing it. Similarly, whether it occurs online versus in person, kind of thing. So, so I did. I did speak to um, the attorneys on our judiciary team, and I mean, we do have a chapter on on what we call computer crimes that I think address some of <laughs> might address some of what you're thinking of, um, and then there take on it was, was sort of if, if it, the elements of a crime are met, then it doesn't, I, I don't know that there's necessarily a distinction between well, the method of it. In the person or right. it wasn't, so I, <coughs> whether it's a computer um, or a gun. So I think it might need, it, it might be helpful to, I guess, be more focused on what we would be referring to the Judiciary Committee. I mean, if it's a review of the computer crimes chapter to see if that is sufficient, you know, if, if there's anything lacking in that chapter right now? Well, one of the common themes across all states is um, kind of a rubber band effect, like uh, technology advances, and then five or ten years later, the laws catch up with it. Um, so trying to structure these things in such a way that it's not tied to any particular technology or method of communication or whatever. Um, yeah. Okay. I guess I, since you have a clear picture in your mind of what you're talking about, would it make sense? Would you be able to talk to Ledge Council who sure. has the knowledge on this and see if there's yeah. gaps that stand out? Because mm -hmm. it seems totally plausible to me that there are, but, but I don't know. Yeah. Uh, the other uh, question I have, does the Attorney General's office, that, um, as we're talking about cyber cri crimes, um, I would think they would also could be very helpful to see if in fact there is um, a need to modernize or revise um, some of the statutes in this area as well. It mm -hmm. seems like it, that's a logical place to explore because it seems like some of that would get into um, Actual situations that they encounter. Is, so, is that something you're willing to follow up with Becky on? Becky, do you feel like you have enough information mm -hmm. to? Okay. Great. Okay. So, next we have developing a risk assessment process within the Agency of Digital Services. That assumes we don't have one. Is that correct? I just need a little bit more clarity. Mm -hmm. risk, <clears throat> if we do risk assessments of projects, if we keep risk logs during the projects, is this a before, after, during maintenance and operation? What To what extent, I think, is just more clarity would be able to... I think we had talked about 3 and 10 possibly being the same thing. 3 and 10. Or referencing the same oh. assessing system vulnerabilities okay. and what actions. So. I, please correct me if I'm wrong. I feel like this, these two items came out of a uh, desire for us to have a prioritization of where the, where, where risk was and to, for the legislature to understand prioritization of where risk was in the systems. So is uh, DMV 
a riskier system than Was it? Sure. Yeah. I wish I brought it? the NCSL right, uh, guide for what legislators should be paying, um, you know, questions that we should be asking. Mm -hmm. And it may not be, it, and many of them would probably fall to the policy committees, but that might be mm -hmm. something to just take a look at to make sure mm -hmm. that, um, that we're um, taking advantage of kind of that work in terms of what. Um, how legislators should be thinking and responding and the questions that we should ask and knowing what's in place. And I didn't regard their it. systems. Yeah, NCSL's guide yeah. to legislators. I you know, I right, I'd, right, like, no, I'd like to go back to that and say, yeah. let's see how we're doing in those areas or did some recommendations flow from uh, from that guide. No, I think this, these issues were derived from the question of what are the Call it ten Cyber biggest security. risks yeah. yes, that um, Vermont faces in information technology, uh, and whether or not the efforts that we're expending are aligned with those risks. Right. And I think that's really what we're trying to get a get a sense of: is there a process that really defines what are the biggest threats that we have, and then you know, are we? devoting our resources oh, right appropriately yeah. to deal with those risks or, or someplace else. And it seems Mike is cleaning up that document center. It, it mm -hmm. seems to me that this is sort of already inherent in the budgeting process, but uh, having said that, ADS is sort of a, a, a bill back. So, I mean, clearly, <coughs> maybe, maybe it's as simple as sort of uh, calling it out as a distinct item, but surely ADS brings forward a budget that reflects their own analysis of vulnerability, right? I'm not sure that it does. So, no, I'm not sure. sure that it does at the all. The thing that I have been no, really so. wanting to make sure is that we are not, I mean, this is such a huge issue mm -hmm. that we are, you know, being careful, but also fulfilling our oversight role and then that we have enough knowledge to support appropriations requests, right? Mm -hmm. And so in terms of, uh, you know, I have no reason to believe that, is this, yeah, no reason to believe that um, ADS is not coming in with, um, you know, they have that, come that, in. that they're doing Actually, that they've come assessment in because we put in funding for sure. the Norwich, yeah. we put in funding sure. for staff, yes. we put uh, money in mm -hmm. for the software yes. acquisition, so yes. it does, uh, mm -hmm. Translate very directly to mm -hmm. right. uh, to some of the requests we've received. Well, item four on this list talks about creating. I'm not sure we need the legislation to do so, but creating some kind of reporting mechanisms on what you call we call level three, four, and five risks to of, of various parts of state government. Isn't this tied in as well with what you're we're talking with system vulnerabilities and mm -hmm. um, risk assessment? Uh, so I, I, Secretary Quinn had his hand up. I just want to make sure. Do you have something you want to say, or are you re-contemplating? No, I, I was just going to say, you know, when we talked about risk, most of the risk that we incur or that's out there is due to lack of funding across, you know, the, the technical debt that we have, the, the age of our systems. This isn't something specific to the state of Vermont. This is something that all 50 states deal with. I just... Uh, left a conference with my you know, 49 other peers and we spent hours talking about how do, we, how do we fund IT going forward because so many of the agencies are in a build back model where we can never get ahead of the curve. We can never, you know, or we haven't figured out a way to, how do you create an innovation fund when everything has to be built back? How do you, how do you? That's a discussion back when Jim Reardon was Commissioner of Finance and Management. <laughs> that, that's the key to the whole thing is where do we get that seed money to build a system that then when agencies are ready we can say we have something ready for you rather than trying to line it up in which fund is where and um, you know human services goes first a lot of times because they have the, the money there but then we have to cost allocate it afterwards and it gets very messy so ac across the United States um, the way we build back and and the funding model is really 
broken. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to add a bullet That's item the here for us to um, look into, which is you know, possibly recommendation of uh, innovation fund at ABS, which I'm sure they will never come in and recommend those costs. <laughs> So let's get, getting back to risk sure. assessment, do we feel so? What do we want to do in this regard? Well, let's see. We Is that too what small? I can make it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Words. <laughs> um. How is right that? Right there. Yeah. You tell me when to scroll. I just so. continue to believe that ADS at some level has that, and, mm -hmm. and I think what we're the talking about is, is helping us understand it, maybe in a predictive way, so that we're not only getting exactly. it in their budget reports exactly. or whatever. Right. But um, so I, I know. I hope we won't go too deep in reinventing anything, but but maybe. And the House has got a technology committee, right? that is much more focused on this issue. I mean, we've got some funding through the capital bill, um, but we don't have the same kind of technology focus that the house has got greater capacity to drill down. Um, well, I guess the question would be, we, we assume we have this, and I, I would ask uh, the secretary, do we have this? We do. Um, throughout different documents that we do as part of a uh, system. So uh, are security metrics available across the enterprise? Yes. Um, and those are on our website dashboard. Um, is data classified by risk? Uh, data is classified by usually federal standards or federal compliance needs, which again speaks to risk because if it's IRS or HIPAA, um, who actually conducts those? And how? Um, so they're usually done um, a number of ways. One of the ways which is new is uh, full vulnerability scanning of each system that we have. And that's, a, that's a new thing in the past year that we're doing before that. Um, we didn't have any visibility into that, so yes, we do that as well. Is um, that available to the legislature? We could. It changes every week because new patches, new security updates come out. So we could have 1,000 one week and 400 the next. Um, but that's pretty granular, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But I think I think you know, in my eyes, knowing that we have that—that's a level of oversight that you'd want to know—is knowing that we're we're um, addressing the risks with these type of scans and these type of uh, assessments. I have a question of Senator Brock. In your former lifetime, you were in the whole field of um, um, security risk, right? Mm -hmm. Do you have um, thoughts and experience from that professional uh, work that you've done that can help us? Because it's got to be transferability in terms of um, what the private sector yes. Uh, yes. is doing in Some, this area. I mean, the private sector is, is grappling with, with the same issues that the public sector is. It just tends to be grappling a little faster. And they have more money. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, so have a more lot of the financial institutions. So these larger corporations yeah. have more have more resources to be able to devote to devote to them. Mm -hmm. So, do we want to make a recommendation? Um, do we want to make a recommendation? Period. Do we want to make a recommendation uh, that committees of jurisdiction ask these questions of ADS that they understand that this is happening? Uh, do we want to take this off the list? Well, I'm just I, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to create uh, a, a bureaucratic nightmare mm -hmm. in terms of requirements being placed throughout state government. Uh, I, I think clearly every every system related activity that uh, an agency is involved in and that the legislature mandates the, the issue of what risks does that action create and are they being well managed is certainly there but that's as much an oversight responsibility not just for us but by the 
committees of jurisdiction mm -hmm. and the agencies themselves have. Uh, what I'm probably more interested in is are these things being effectively and independently evaluated in terms of risk and that's as much an audit type mm -hmm. responsibility and as you recall <coughs> we've asked uh, the auditor and we haven't gotten real good answers back on that because it's a, a capacity issue for them as well yeah. in which they need to get outside resources to help them. They've only got one real IT auditor in, in, the, in the auditor's office. Uh, but that to me is the most important thing is to having that oversight be built in to everything that we do throughout state government that we do have an effective risk assessment process that we understand the risks that we're facing and that we have adequate responses to those risks and if we aren't able to that we've identified what we aren't able to do assign criticality to it and have a plan for at least raising it to the legislature's attention for the resources necessary to deal with I think it. you just Framed a recommendation. Yeah, I think so. Maybe. Yeah, don't ask me to repeat it. Okay. I was seeing the light bulb. Mike wrote it down. Yeah. Well, I would also <laughs> mention any new project over a million dollars has to go through an independent review process where they, where they go through these questions and evaluate the risks to the project. So that would be a recommendation to mm -hmm. the committees of jurisdiction, mm -hmm. which yeah. would be energy and technology in the House. Who would it be? The finance and Senate. Need to ask these questions? Well, or? I mean, the questions ought to be asked for people who are building integrated eligibility, for example. And that's what I'm saying, is, is, is these kinds of things have to be embedded in everything that you do, not just in some committee that has the responsibility know, for, quote, right. security. That's right. It, it's sort of like, how do you legislate good practice? Yeah, it's, like, it's like good health. Everybody's mm -hmm. got to practice stuff to be able to be healthy. You don't, you know, expect your doctor to deal with your rate loss. <laughs> I just buy bigger clothes. <laughs> <laughs> Elastic waist. <laughs> well, I'm going to I'm going to try and keep us on track here cuz we're okay. already oh, we're already right. over. Oh. So, do we want to do we want to act on this? Leave this hearing and come back to it? Do we want You know what? How about center? How about if we get you to write, to write up what you said. So eloquently, would you, would you be willing to do that? I, I can try. Okay. It's recorded. All right. Oh, yeah. 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 Of course. Yeah. 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 And Becky. Well, I'll yeah. 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 read the last, last month's sure. to kind of yeah. reframe yeah. what else. Okay. So I'm going to okay. assume that's three and ten. Um, So for number four, is the first one related? I, I think it is. Okay. Well, well I think yeah. it all fills in. Yeah. yeah. But wasn't, wasn't that just, you know, when an incident occurred? We're this talking is about a protocol. Occurring. I don't think. So, mm -hmm. This is oh. risk. So this is, right? Level four, three, four, and five. It wasn't risk. It no, was it wasn't incident. risk. It was incidents. 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 Yes, incidents. OK. So this is um, a system for notifying the legislature um, of, so there's three things here. A system for notifying the legislature of those level um, breaches. Incidents. Incidents. Um, as well as um, a system of notifying us when there are audits, audits and system testing. I know. This is. Which I understand can be quite large. And then uh, state data backup requirements. And so, you know, I've spent a little bit of time talking with Secretary Quinn about this and Becky about this. And one of the things that I've asked Secretary Quinn is if he could propose, um, if he could actually propose what something, what um, might be appropriate. Do you need legislation for, for this? I don't know. I, I think yeah. actually in terms of, uh, how would we, how would the legislature do its, conduct its, um, be able to conduct its oversight um, if we are not notified of breaches? And so how can we ensure notification of breaches at that level? Do we have an, I mean, I think we have an obligation to know. Maybe the committee does not. Well, Is I'm this just, something we want to punt? I, I don't, I, I, I'm not prepared to make a recommendation mm -hmm. um, that we do it. 
uh, I'm thinking that there are a variety. We talked about uh, other public safety. We talked about uh, you know, do we have in statute a requirement if you had a um, you know a, a riot at a correctional facility. I mean, just think about it, some of the emergency management kinds of things, um, and um, it raises a, a host of issues around why this one incident relative to all these other um, emergency situations. Um, I don't. I don't think we've got protocol for every single one to you know report back to us. I think commissioners, as a matter of course, would contact the committee chairs or whatever as heads up. But um, these are more internal protocols. So uh, I I I don't feel comfortable that we should propose um, identifying you know uh, cybersecurity uh, breaches. Elevated above uh, all these other kinds of incidents that um, we may not address. I have a statutory requirement, so um, that's my concern about um, um, putting something in 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 statute. And how does this square with a host of other kinds of situations that um, it, that are potentially out there or are out there over time? So that that. That's my concern about singling out one type of incident mm -hmm. and saying that rises to the top um, mm -hmm. in terms of I mean, some things that are just based on judgment. That I think we, we we need to rely on official judgment to tell us things that we need to know. But as a practical matter, in terms of the urgency of telling us that, it's not anything we're going to do about it anyway. <laughs> right. right. But we'd love to. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're absolutely right. It is judgment. It is yeah. judgment. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, and it's hard to legislate judgment and common sense. I could save a lot of health money if I could legislate we live healthy and depart quickly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. For that, I'd be a bit, because cybersecurity is a, the, the difference between it and other crimes is it's a, an emerging market, as it were. Um, it's the sort of thing where people are um, not entirely uh, familiar with, with the topic, so um, it, it might be prudent to keep a closer eye on it than some of the existing um, criminal activity like drugs and burglary and so forth, um, and perhaps a, a sunset or something like that. So it's like, all right, let's keep a, a, a closer eye on this topic for, you know, a couple of years or something well, like that. If you that want a, some see. kind of report, I mean, I don't know, do you have, in terms of, a lot of uh, reports, huh? reports. I know, I hate reports yeah. too, and um, um, most of them, unfortunately, don't get read by very many. Um, the report not exceeding one page. Well, frankly, we do need to be careful about that because legislative attention and a capacity is, is limited. So um, I think that's a part of you know making recommendations that we want to have rise to the top for committee attention because there are a lot more bills out there than um, committees ever can um, consider. If we want to somehow collect, but that's only within state government that those security breaches um it, we're not talking about the general public we're correct. not talking no, about no, no. you know correct. i mean so uh, i'm just thinking in terms of cyber crimes and so forth a lot of that would be external to state government I, so i don't know how to um i agree in other words how mm. do we get a, a better grasp on the magnitude of the um, um of the uh, situations or the number of incidents. Well, to your example, um, since it is related to state government, how do we currently compile, um, you know, facility vandalism or, or damage or burglary for state property currently? Is that uh, up to the individual committee to, to, you know, review if it's brought to their attention kind of thing, if something needs to change? BGS. I mean, I was thinking. Go to BGS. BGS. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking just based on working yeah. with the institutions committees. I I don't think that's something that they regularly hear about unless BGS is asking for money to 
you know, repair something. But I don't know as a matter of course no, I don't they think would. So. I mean, I don't. Obviously, there's different, Can you, you know, levels of, of seriousness. But for something small, I don't think that that's something they would regularly report. Okay. No. Um, you know, I think Secretary Quinn had um, walked us through notifications. Um, was it last meeting? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, was it this one? Yes. Excuse me. Yeah. yeah. It was that one. And okay. what I had asked him, so this this is all internal process that they have. And so I think that there is a value in making a, a some sort of articulating some sort of formal can you click on that? Is it this one? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I mm -hmm. There's a large flow chart in there. Right, right there. here. Yeah. So <clears throat> we see where the legislature is, and those are in like those are informal. Every time there's a crime. Mm -hmm. So this is internal and informal, and I don't think we need to be a part of all of that. But that place mm -hmm. where we have the legislature. Uh, you know, we, we're, where we're notifying folks, you know, I, I think that that is a place where I would like to see us kind of articulate what is that, you know, what is, what is it that we're doing? You know, how does that happen? And my concern is really around oversight, making sure, so I think we've got a great partner in Secretary Quinn, you know, I think he's pretty proactive in terms of notifying us not going to be in the position forever, nor will we be here forever. You know, what is that process? I, um, I'm really struggling with this because it, to use another analogy, if we look at, at criminal justice, it would be uh, what we're talking about is whenever the, a, a high-level breach, if we were to say to public safety, report to the legislature every time there's a murder, Mm -hmm. or there is a significant, you know, uh, um, issue of uh, law enforcement. I mean, I'm just trying to look at how we set up something here that's consistent with our expectations for other areas of, of crimes or breaches. And um, while we're focusing on the IT, I, I'm just trying to look at sort of uh, how it conforms or aligns with all the other areas of, of uh, state government in terms of what we expect back to report. And so I, I you know, I just, I, I maybe at, if you had something um, at the end of the year that says to us, these are the number of incidents we had in state government. These are the ones that are very serious. These are the ones that, in order to address this, we are recommending that we uh, acquire, uh, that we acquire, um, you know, uh, this would be our recommended response to uh, address that, um, um, that need. Uh, that, that could tie into, with the benefit of experience, get it to the legislature in terms of what you need for a legislative response to address it. And some of that is happening already, right, in your reporting. Yeah. But it's the, there's... But we didn't ask for the number of incidents. We, we assume, when they said to us, we're worried about this risk, we, we, we took their word for it. We didn't, you know, ask, uh, I called you, you were away, and, you know, um, and, in terms of tell me, and I didn't ask for you know um, how many levels of risk and so forth that l that was behind your recommendation. I must confess, I did, I didn't do it. I accepted your assessment that we were at significant risk and we needed to spend the money. Right. I mean, there's there's just there's so much that we don't know, and we're not going to know all of that. You know, so that is really. Um, Okay. Well, I think we'll maybe come back to this. Unless folks want to continue to push on it or mm -hmm. we want to take it. Do we feel like there do we feel like this is an area where we need to come to some um, to come to some recommendation that there's 
any kind of action warranted. I don't think there is. I don't think there's, I think there's existing reporting already yeah. that comes out of, certainly out of ADS, I don't know about <laughs> the judiciary, but certainly comes out of ADS regarding, as we talked about, you know, we've had an experience in the last year that's a problem and we want to address it in such and such a way. So okay, that, that gives us that assurance that they are following it and now they see there needs to be something done about it. So breaches or incidents, mm -hmm. um, we are, how, how are we providing oversight? How are we providing oversight of the executive branch that they are maintaining, you know, that they're that they are properly protecting Vermonters information if there are breaches. I don't know if there is already, but you know, there could be a, a suggestion that the annual report should include a paragraph on what has been the status of breaches in the past year and if there are any untoward um, results that need to be addressed. I, I just see it as being folded into a routine annual report. So adding some sort of um, additional specificity around breaches into the annual report? Something along those lines, two, bar two more paragraphs or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's fine. Just, uh, you know, I, it's not like we have a lot of breaches. Um, we have a lot of incidents where we further investigate and find yeah. mm -hmm. that nope it's okay um, and that's that's my hesitation with notifying people too early you know if, if I no, was, I'm talking about yeah. at, I think what Marty and I are talking about at the end of the year when you're doing your right. report to give us a sense of the magnitude of, of the experience of that year yeah, in this particular that. area and, and it's not just breaches it, uh, and incidents yeah. in general in other words a squirrel bring you down all of our systems for a week or, or whatever the case may That's be. That's why that, that one was out here for yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, But, but it, it, incidents might be a better term than breaches, right. but okay. uh, serious uh, issues regarding information technology that should be brought to our attention. Mm. Which gets yeah. into the judgment. It's yeah. a judgment issue. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I do think that, uh, we, you know, we're, we're talking largely about ADS, but uh, the legislature and the judiciary are also things that, that we're interested in. For example, if the court system has been brought down for a week because it can't use its information technology, I think we, we probably would like to know about it rather than be kept in the dark. But that's judgment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So for that number four, that reporting requirement seems a little different to me than the, the notification <coughs> requirement and the, the back the data backups. Um, I just didn't know if, if you would like to also make a recommendation on those. Do we want to recommend um, hmm. So I think the second one came from when the, there was the Department of Homeland Security test yes. testing that there was a, the legislative and judicial branches didn't weren't notified ahead of time although I, I guess mm -hmm. but then we also had testimony that they recognized that it should have been done and in, in mm -hmm. the future mm -hmm. they would um, um, have have that notification in place. I mean, that was what I understood was mm -hmm. said, and Kevin, you're nodding your head. So, um, um, well, we've it, got number seven, which mm -hmm. says talking about cooperation yeah. between. Yeah. So education. it falls in that bucket. Um, yeah, we can legislate cooperation. <laughs> sure. Um, okay. Let's well, see. you know. Um, it do, it doesn't mean that that um, it has to translate into a, a, a bill. It could be just a recommendation that there um, be protocols uh, established to uh, notify, um, and then we can declare a victory because it's been done. There you go. Yeah, but it, I'm just thinking that um, we it could be as simple as that. Okay, I think that's. 
Uh, we had talked about um, maybe it was you, Senator, that had recommended um, with re so state data backup requirements. Um, you know, John was asking. You know, that's all over the place. Um, and I think was it you or was it Becky that had made this suggestion that uh, maybe it was Becky? Um, I'll take it. Yeah, making sure all uh, agencies develop oh, okay. backup requirements. It was you, Becky. I think it was you. Protocols. Do they already have it? Well, yes. No. Yes. So, yeah. So the. The backup protocols wouldn't come from us necessarily. It's based on what the business needs, what the recovery point time is, what the recovery point, um, uh, you know, what they need to get back. So do we need to back up hourly? Do we need to back up daily? Do we need to back up weekly? Mm -hmm. All those have cost drivers. So each agency picks those based on the classification of the data and mm -hmm. how sensitive the data is and what they need from the data. So we found in most cases that um, this is a cost driver for agencies. So, you know, we found very few systems um, across the 1,400 applications that we have that require something to be up all the time. What right? does that mean? So, the, so you think about you back up every 24 hours, yeah. maybe. But in order to rebuild that system, you have that backup of 24 hours ago. How quickly does it need to come back up as well? Mm -hmm. Right? So if the system crashes and it goes down and it needs to be re rebuilt, how quickly does that system need to be rebuilt? Is it an hour? Is it a week? Is it eight weeks? Um, it, it all depends on each system. So this is left up to the agencies with guidance from ADS on the criticality of the system and that's how their backups are defined. So each agency has already given us input and decides whether we keep the backups for one week, two weeks, two months, two years, and that falls in line with the retention periods as well. Mm -hmm. Is there reporting done on that? No. The backups? No. We do thousands of backups. There's a reporting done on the standard for backup. In terms of is there any record of the standards for backup? Like, do you, is that some formal process that the agencies adopt or go through? Or? Um, there's an enterprise assessment done with each new system um, and there's an SLA where we talk about the backups and what the uh, recovery times will be and what the, the, the backup schedule would be and that drives the cost. So, so if we, an agency... we probably have a lot of the documentation buried down in the technical document documents. Mm -hmm. I'm just not, I don't look at it myself, right? So I don't want to tell you, yes, everything's Perfect, but we have most of that documentation, I would think. Is there ever a time when an agency might say, you don't think that they're doing the right assessment in terms of the criticality of their system, or you rely on the people who know what the work is um, and what the system has to support to make that determination around the criticality? Yeah, I, I think, you know, there, there are times maybe that where with an enterprise type system, I may disagree. Um, but at the end of the day, it's their system, it's their data. They know their customer better than I do. And if they're willing to take that risk on, you know, a system being down for two days and, you know, only having back a backup from a week ago, then I have to use their judgment. It's their money. Um, I think we're going to pause here because we're 30 minutes over. Yeah. Um, so, Becky, I would ask you to kind of flesh out a little bit uh, mm -hmm. on the ones that we were able to okay. to work on. Um, you know, certainly Senator Brock and I um, continue to communicate. We'll come back to this, I think, okay. in mm -hmm. November. Um, Mike reminds us that we have a change of venue. Yep, so our next meeting is scheduled for the 15th of November. Um, it's on your calendars, but mm -hmm. the location is different because this building will most likely still be shut down for the electrical renovations that it's going through. Um, an optimist would say no, but most of the buildings say yes. So we've arranged for the next meeting to be in the fourth floor of the boardroom, the fourth floor boardroom of the tax department. Yeah, it's 133 state. You check it at the front desk, we'll have everything lined up and ready to go. And mm -hmm. it should be the same experience that you're used to here. It just will be there. Um, I am not going to be able to attend. Uh, okay. Out of the 
country. Understood. I am gone as well. Okay. Where are you going? Not Bolivia again. I'll <laughs> be physically here. It's good to know. Uh, okay. And I do lots of sending represent Chase you, to audio. Uh, can you make sure that Senator Pearson? I already uh, talked to him on his way up. He's going to be here. When he left, yeah. yeah so. Okay. so that's fine. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. I have to send Senator, uh, Representative Chase uh, the audio from September's meeting. Uh, and then oh, just tell me where it is. And I can... It's a wink, I'll send it to you. That's right. And, the then, same thing. and then check okay. in Senator Brock in October. Yeah. Did you want September also? Uh, I just I wanted what I said today. I don't know. October. <laughs> <laughs> it's like an hour ago. Right? <laughs> you should have bookmarked it so you know what to Oh, you did. I wrote down the time. I don't care. Oh, oh, good. You're all so, set up uh, just in terms of next meeting, we are going to hear more from ADS and BLCT. Um, mm -hmm. that, we'll just continue that conversation. Um, we're going to hear from Jill Romek on the parcel mapping and the um, assessments that they did or the surveying that they did yep. um, as part of that. We'll hear back from integrated eligibility um, yep. on a big picture overall financing as well as I think we heard timeline going forward, um, staffing and financial um, going forward. And, and all of those okay. people have already confirmed that they'll be there for that meeting. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.